The committee, uh, subcommittee on select revenue will please come to order. Good morning and welcome to all my colleagues, uh, particularly ranking member Mr. Smith of Nebraska and uh, two distinguished panels of witnesses who have joined us here this morning. Uh, this morning's hearing is examining the impact of the tax code on Native American tribes. Such an examination has been a long time coming. While we've had several votes on tribal provisions as uh, discrete standalone measures or as part of broader legislative package, packages, the committee and its subcommittees have not recently held a hearing dedicated to the interplay between the federal tax code and sovereign tribal governments. That interplay is critically important to Native American communities, and this hearing is considerably overdue. Federal taxation can affect the ability of tribes to provide health care, education, and public assistance to their members. Too often, our federal rules can create an imbalance between the treatment of tribes that hampers this ability. For example, restrictions on the issuance of tax-exempt debt can prevent tribes from meeting financing needs in the same way our state and local governments can do it. It's incumbent upon Congress to review our laws to promote fair treatment of tribal governments and their members. Our tax, our tax code can also affect the ability of, tri of tribes to access capital and sustain meaningful economic growth. Overall, about 25% of Native Americans live in poverty in 2017, compared to about 13% for the U.S. general population. At the same time, the tax incentives that we know are successful in encouraging economic opportunity are harder to access for tribes. For example, only $1 billion of the $48.3 billion of investments diverse, diverse, disbursed through the New Markets tax credit, tax credit Program have gone to businesses operating in Native American areas. Over my time in Congress and in the state government, I've seen firsthand both the successes and the challenges faced by tribes and their members. Every time I visit these communities, it reaffirms my commitment to helping their members thrive. I know many others who sit on the subcommittee, the Ways and Means Committee, and in the Congress feel the same way. I'm especially pleased uh, that for our first panel, we will be joined by three of our four Democratic and Republican colleagues in the House who are tribal members themselves, Representative Davids, Hallahan, and Mullen. Their testimony today will be invaluable to the subcommittee as it considers these issues going forward. For our second panel, will collect even more expertise from five tribal leaders who will cover a wide variety of tax issues facing their communities. It's my hope that their testimony will form a solid basis for any action that this committee takes on tribal taxation. Finally, before turning to the ranking member, I want to emphasize the great opportunity we have here to work on a bipartisan basis. We both know members from both sides of the aisle that have gotten together to tackle problems on behalf of their Native American constituents and communities. As I mentioned earlier, this issue is ripe for consideration, and I believe that any sound and lasting tax changes in this area will require bipartisan cooperation. With that, I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Smith of Nebraska, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and certainly thank you to our witnesses uh, appearing across two panels today. Like so many others in America, tribal citizens deserve fairness and economic opportunity, and yet there always remains more work to do. Poverty for tribal citizens on reservation and trust lands remains higher than uh, for the total population, as we heard earlier. We in Congress must always look for ways to improve conditions for the better, with the thoughtful insights provided by all of our witnesses here today. After all, prosperity is a project driven not by government, by, but by our local communities and ultimately consumers. And even in the face of the novel coronavirus, our economy remains strong for working Americans. Our renewed economy means more patrons for businesses operated by tribes in tribal lands. 
It means a stronger foundation for Native American-owned businesses. Workers from all walks of life saw more jobs, fairer taxes, and bigger paychecks after tax reform. But how have Native Americans fared? We are eager to hear from our witnesses how we can best use our tax code to provide more opportunity for all to succeed. Republicans' goal is to continue improving the tax code to ensure it is as fair and consistent as possible while continuing to reduce the burden of compliance on all Americans. I also want to thank you, you Mr. Chairman, for calling today's hearing. I think it uh, can be especially productive. I see it as an opportunity to have a constructive bipartisan conversation about areas of the tax code which aren't necessarily in the spotlight, but are certainly of importance to many Americans. There are often complex interactions between tribal concerns and the tax code. These issues largely arise from a failure to ensure tribal governments are treated like state and local governments for appropriate purposes. We made some progress in, in this area in the last several Congresses, uh, passed unanimously by Congress, the Tribal Social Security Fairness Act of 2018 was long overdue legislation to ensure fairness for our tribal governments concerning Social Security. The bipartisan legislation, which was led by this committee, allowed tribal councils to have the choice whether or not they can choose to participate in Social Security, just as our state and local governments are allowed to do so. The Tribal General Welfare Exclusion Act of 2014 made sure that need-based payments made by tribes to tribal members are not taxed, just like similar payments made by state and local government. And the 2014 Act also created a Treasury Tribal Advisory Committee to interact with the Treasury and the IRS and make sure they are educated about tribal customs and practices. These were important common sense efforts, but we know there is more that we need to do in this area. I look forward to a constructive conversation, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, without objections, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. For our first panel, we're honored to welcome our colleagues in the House of Representatives uh, to each proceed with a statement. First, I'd like to welcome Representative Hallalan, uh, who represents the first district of New Mexico. She is a member of the Pueblo Laguna tribe. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to speak about some key measures in the tax code and its, and its impact on Native nations. It's an honor to be here with my colleagues, Vice Chairs of the Native American Caucus, Sharice Davids and Mark Wayne Mullen. And we thank all of you for your work and for having this important hearing. I'd first like to say that success in Indian country is, a, is success for America. And, um, but also tribal lands have many unique complexities that create unnecessary barriers to generate revenues for public services. As you know, federal, state, and local governments use tax dollars and financing options for the construction of roads, bridges, schools, water systems, and public safety. However, tribes can't collect property tax revenues because their tribal lands are held in trust, leaving them without some revenue mechanisms that would provide basic governmental services. Data from the U.S. Census Bureau found that taxes provide 41% of local general revenues for state governments and 30% of this funding comes directly from property taxes. This structure automatically places tribes at an economic disadvantage for economic development. Tribes are also subject to restrictions on federal excise taxes and financing options, including additional reporting requirements that state, states and local governments do not have to comply with. For example, tribes have added requirements for tax-exempt bonds to show that funds are directly related to essential government functions. However, states don't have to comply with these extra bureaucratic hurdles and can freely expand their tax-exempt bonds to commercial activities to generate revenues. Additionally, dual taxation is another parity issue that disadvantages tribal governments. Today, dual taxation exists for tribal tax immunity, exists for certain on-reservation commercial transactions because tribal tax immunity cannot fall below state tax rates. When tribes are unable to offer tax incentives to attract profitable, profitable businesses, they have been forced to rely on business on enterprises on tribal lands to promote private investments to fill in substantial revenue gaps. Congress must seek tribal parity and inclusion of tax 
and capital incentives through opportunities like new markets tax credits to remove these economic barriers on reservations. For example, the new market tax credits help my tribe, the Pueblo of Laguna, replace a dilapidated grocery store that couldn't stock healthy food options since it didn't have refrigeration or freezer storage areas. In these geographically isolated areas, tribal tax incentives are fundamental to provide revenues for basic resources like fresh food and water. The new market tax credits also helped my Pueblo complete the rehabilitation of the water and wastewater system, supported a new fire protection system, and created new jobs for tribal members and low-income employees in New Mexico. Low-income housing tax credits are also critical to extend tax credit equity and housing grants to tribal lands because debt financing for housing is severely limited. Like other governments, tribes should receive their funding directly for housing tax credits so they can increase the availability of tribal housing. The Department of Housing and Urban Development stated there are 543,000 Native Americans living in households that are overcrowded, substandard, and cost burdensome, and about 90,000 Native Americans who are homeless or underhoused. I take this issue very personally because I was also homeless at one time, trying to raise my daughter as a single mom, trying to make ends meet. Because poverty and underemployment rates in Indian country are twice the national average, tribes must receive tribal tax parity and direct funding like any other government. I would like to convey my strong support for all tribal tax incentive programs and capital market provisions that will be addressed today. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for inviting me to speak on this important issue today. I am grateful for your work and leadership on this issue to help level the playing field for tribal communities. I yield. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Representative Sharice Davids. Ms. Davids represents the 3rd District of Canvas, Kansas. She is a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation, a Native American tribe in Wisconsin. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Smith and to the rest of the committee for holding this hearing today. It's such an important topic. This means a great deal to me to have the opportunity to testify today alongside my colleagues and co-chairs of the Native American Caucus. I'd like to thank you especially for the committee's willingness to examine tribal tax issues, a subject which hasn't received a great deal of attention in the past years. For far too long, Native American voices have been woefully underrepresented in Congress. Issues that have relevance to tribal communities have routinely been minimized and ignored, recognizing that I do have colleagues who have been working on some of these issues for years prior to my uh, being elected to this body. That's why I've pushed, uh, because of the, the lack of, of representation and voices for so long, I've been pushing the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee which I proudly serve on, to hold its first hearing in nearly 20 years looking at the transportation needs of tribes and Indian country. It is my hope that this committee, along with other committees in the House, can serve as a proving ground for the greater inclusion of tribal voices in federal policy, and that tribes can be regularly consulted on national tax issues. While we don't have tribal lands in the Kansas 3rd District that would be impacted by federal tax policy, I hear regularly from Indian country about the challenges and inequality faced when it comes to the federal tax code. I've also seen it firsthand. Before beginning my time in Congress, I spent part of my year working in community and economic development with tribal communities. I did that work all across the country. I even spent time living and working on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. I worked regularly with folks in Indian country that were trying to start new businesses and find financing for economic development projects that were in the public interest. That includes projects with tribal level uh, tribal level projects as well as organizational projects from groups that were working on native reservations. I saw that programs sometimes work and that programs sometimes don't. There are plenty of places where we can do better. That's what I'd like to focus on today. In order to do that, I feel like we need to set a baseline of understanding. Tribes in this country do not operate like cities, municipalities, and counties that we all represent. Oftentimes, and I say that recognizing that they do provide a public interest for their tribal members. Oftentimes, the eligibility rec requirements for federal programs are different or higher for tribes 
meaning they face additional barriers to planning and development for their economic development pursuits. This has serious implications for tribal governments. There are programs that are helping to address this issue and some that are succeeding. One program that has, provide a that has provided a tremendous collective benefit outside of Indian country, as mentioned by the chairman and my colleague, uh, Representative Halland, is the New Market Tax Credit Program, which provides an incentive for investments in low-income communities. Communities. While tribes have been successful in working with and creating community development financial institutions and have put themselves in the best position to attain new markets tax credits, tribal entities only received 0.3% of investments from 2003 to 2015, according to the Tax Policy Center. I encourage the committee to strongly consider efforts that would shore up and expand the new markets tax credit whenever possible while making sure that tribes have a fair shot at the same investment assistance available to the rest of the country. One such effort I'm proud to support and co-sponsor is H.R. 1680, the New Markets Tax Credit Extension Act. <coughs> this important bill would make the New Markets Tax Credit permanent, allowing community development entities greater certainty that this incentive will be around to support them in their future. As mentioned by my, my colleague, Congresswoman Hallen, Sometimes these new market deals are very beneficial for plenty of tribal communities, but there are often too many times that tribal communities try to engage in economic development opportunities for the benefit of their entire community and have been met with many barriers. We have the opportunity in this Congress to help address some of those issues. I ask that you continue your work. Please keep in mind the interests of those in Indian country who face unique challenges and also have unique opportunities that are often less left out of the national conversation. With that, I thank you again and I yield back. Thank you very much. Our next uh, witness will be Representative Mark Wayne Mullen, rep who represents the second district of Oklahoma and is a member of the Cherokee Nation. Thank you, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Smith for allowing me to share my thoughts on the treatment of Native Americans on tribal governments and tribal governments in the tax code. I would also like to thank our full committee chairman, Neil, and Ranking Member Brady, or Brady, sorry, I want to say Bradley, Brady, uh, for their continued leadership and interest in Indian country. Tribal governments play a key role in investing in our local communities and driving, in our, and driving our economy. In Oklahoma in 2017 alone, tribal government supported more than 96,000 jobs and had a total economic impact of 12.9 billion dollars. That's in Oklahoma alone. Tribal sovereignty is the foundation for the economic success and prosperity of Native Americans. However, at times, the federal government has failed to treat tribal governments like actual governments. When crafting legislation and regulations, tribal governments are often overlooked or simply left out by mistake. The lack of parity has resulted in missed opportunities for growth throughout Indian Country. The bill the subcommittee has drafted provides important changes on several key provisions that have bipartisan support. I'd like to highlight two of those provisions, the Indian Employment Tax Credit and the Adoption Tax Credit. The Indian Employment Tax Credit provision would permanently extend the, the created and modify to cr credit and modify the formula. This, this tax credit is designed to encourage employers to hire Native Americans who are members of federally recognized tribes and live in Indian Country. In my district, Eastern Oklahoma, approximately 18% of the population is Native American. My district also includes Choctaw County, one of the poorest counties in the nation with a poverty rate of 31%. By leveraging the Indian Employment Tax Credit, the Choctaw Nation has been able to bring in hundreds of new jobs, add to the skilled workforce, and revitalize the region. Without the Indian Employment Tax Credit, these opportunities would not be possible. The draft bill also includes the Adoption Tax Credit. Congress created a tax credit to incentivize the adoption of children with special needs. Currently, the IRS does not recognize a determination by a tribal court that a child is considered special needs. This means Native American children and their adopted families are unable to claim the tax credit. 
This, pre this provision in the draft bill brings parity to the tribal government by allowing adopted parents to receive an adopted uh, adoption tax credit when tribes have determined the child has special needs. Keep in mind, the tribe is the one that's providing the health care for these children too. I think they're more than capable to be able to, to make that determination. <clears throat> we should be doing everything we can to encourage and facilitate adoption by bringing parity to the adoption tax credit. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to share my thoughts on the treatment of Indian country and the tax code. As a Native American, I'm excited to see Congress reviewing these issues and offering real bipartisan solution. I yield back. Thank you very much. Representative Tom Cole, who's a member of the Chickasaw Nation, wanted to be here to testify before the subcommittee today, but unfortunately he has an appropriations uh, committee hearing dealing with the coronavirus, and I think we all recognize the importance of him being there. But shortly before we gaveled in, he stopped by to express his excitement that the subcommittee is holding a public uh, examination of tribal issues and to deliver uh, his written remarks. I have those here, and without objection, uh, this written testimony will be made part of our record. Uh, thank you all very much. It was insightful to hear from you. You bring a wealth of experience and knowledge, and we appreciate it very much. So thank you all for being here. I'd like to invite the next panel of witnesses to the table. Once you're seated, then we can begin with the introductions. Well, welcome uh, to all of our distinguished witnesses. Thank you for being here. And at this time, I'd like to yield to Representative Del Baney to introduce uh, Fawn Sharp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to welcome President Fawn Sharp um, here to the other Washington, as we would call it, um, in our home of Washington State. Thanks for being here today and sharing your expertise with the committee. Um, president Sharp serves as the 23rd president of the National Congress of American Indians, NCAI, the oldest, largest, and most representative American Indian and Alaska Native tribal government organization in the country. She is the third woman to hold the position of NCAI president. Um, she is also the president of the Quinault Indian Nation in Washington State. Her past positions include manage, managing attorney and lead counsel and staff attorney for the Quinault Indian Nation, um, administrative law judge for the Washington State Department of Revenue. Um, President Sharp has also held numerous leadership positions, including an appointment by Governor Gary Locke to serve as trustee for Grays Harbor College, governor of the Washington State Bar Association, trustee of Washington, the Washington State Bar Association Indian Law Section, vice president and founding member for the National Intertribal Tax Alliance, and director secretary of the Quinault Nation Enterprises Board. President Sharp graduated from Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington, um, go Zags, um, and uh, with a bachelor's at the age of 19. She received her law degree from the University of Washington, go Huskies, um, in 1995 and has subsequently received certificates from the National Judicial College at the University of Nevada and from the International Human Rights Law at Oxford University. She is incredibly accomplished and experienced um, we're so honored to have her, and as a fellow Washingtonian, I'm proud to welcome you to this committee, and I look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. And now I yield to Representative Moore to introduce uh, Christina Danforth. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I am so delighted 
to see you, Madam Chairwoman, once a chairwoman, always a chairwoman. Uh, 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 Christina Danforth uh, comes from a very, very active, prestigious family in Wisconsin, former chairwoman of the Oneida tribe, and now president of uh, NAFOA, uh, which uh, it, it deals with the laws and policies affecting Indian country and Native Americans so that uh, we can meet our trust responsibilities and fulfill our promises to Indian country. A lot, a lot of work. Um, um, I, uh, we always knew you as Tina Danforth. I didn't know it was Christina, but you also have another Oneida name, uh, Kualakni, how do you say it? Walagani, which means influential. Um, and uh, certainly she, she has had a record uh, that has been very clear that she's an influential person and we really look forward to your testimony. Uh, and more importantly, we look forward to your working closely with us to make sure that we implement the laws uh, that we have here, tax law, uh, from today forward. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Now I'll um, yield to Representative Larson to introduce Rodney Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this uh, extraordinarily important uh, uh, hearing. Um, and uh, it is my deep honor to uh, introduce uh, Rodney Butler, who is the chairman of the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation and has been so since January of 2010. Uh, Rodney's uh, service to the Tribal Council began back in 2004, and uh, then later in 2005, he was appointed as the Tribal Council Treasurer, a position he held and served with distinction through 2009. During that tenure, Mr. Butler chaired the tribe's finance and housing and judiciary committees and served as the interim CEO of the Foxwoods uh, Resort Casino. Chairman Butler uh, earned uh, his bachelor's degree uh, in finance from the University of Connecticut, uh, go Huskies, uh, <clears throat> where he played defensive back uh, for the university. Uh, and uh, Dan Kildean said, in fact, that he thought he should have been nominated for the Heisman. And uh, Ron Kine said that uh, he's glad he didn't have to play against him when he was at Harvard. He would have been my mortal enemy. He would have been a mortal <laughs> enemy, but uh, uh, he's also worked in the finance department and he later uh, became chairman of the Tribal Business Advisory Board, uh, the executive body responsible for overseeing the tribe's non-gaming businesses and commercial properties of which the Mashantucket Pequots have been extensively involved. He was uh, and has and continues to be actively involved in the resort expansions at Foxwoods as well as Face uh, 7 housing development on the reservation and the establishment of the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Endowment Trust. He also has participated in Harvard Business School's program where he did not run into Ron Kind, but nonetheless, uh, as Chairman uh, Butler uh, has uh, always been an incredible uh, force uh, for good in the state of Connecticut, not only with the Tribal Nation, and I would note that the Mohegan Tribal Nation is here today and uh, represented by uh, uh, Liz Malera, uh, who's uh, in our audience as well. Uh, Connecticut has been blessed uh, to have such outstanding sovereign nations who continue to work not only for tribal nations in the state of Connecticut and across the country, but for the betterment of communities uh, that they come in contact with, the state of Connecticut, and I dare say the entire nation. Rodney, welcome, glad to have you here. Thank you, uh, Mr. Larson. I want to extend a warm welcome to Chairman Kenny Kahn, from my home state of California. Chairman Khan has served on the Chumash Tribes Governing Board, the Business Committee, 
since 2003 and has served as tribal chairman since 2016. During his tenure as chairman, the tribe has seen enormous success. Relevant to today's discussion, in 2019, the Chumash tribe became the first tribe in the nation to successfully refinance tax-exempt debt under the Tribal Economic Development Bond Program. And I know that Chairman Kahn and the tribe are also enormously proud of the new land added to their reservation by Congress last year. And it is great to have a venophile on the, uh, on the panel. Uh, I'm glad that you're here and uh, that you share uh, some of our passion for the industry that's commonly known as the lifeblood of my congressional district. And you have a very uh, a prominent wine interest in, in, in your tribal uh, area as well. Uh, Chairman, thank you for coming out to support the committee's work and I look forward to hearing from you on this important topic, the tax stuff, not the wine stuff. Uh, now I'll turn to um, Representative Walorski uh, to represent uh, to introduce our next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am so honored to have the opportunity to introduce to all of you Matt Weesaw, the Tribal Council Chairman of the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi and President of the Pokagon Gaming Authority. In this role, he oversees the management and operations of the tribe's Four Winds Casinos Gaming Enterprises in Indiana and Michigan. Chairman Weesaw is very active with the national Native American community, having served in numerous leadership positions and was recognized as a 2011 Tribal Leader of the Year by the Native American Financial Officers Association. Chairman Weesaw also has a decorated career in public service, receiving three gubernatorial appointments and enjoying a 26 year career as a state trooper. Chairman Weesaw, I'm grateful that you're here today. I look forward to a productive dialogue for all of us as we examine ways to ensure tax fairness for tribes around the country. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I'll yield to Mr. Kildee now, who also would like to make some comments about our last panelist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd also like to welcome uh, Chairman Weesaw. Uh, I have the honor of representing Michigan, uh, which, uh, as my colleague said, is the home to the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians along with the state of Indiana. So, Mr. Chairman, it's, uh, it's great to have you here. I welcome you and I really look forward to this hearing. It's an honor, an honor that you're all here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kildee. Um, thank you all for being here today. Uh, each of your statements will be made part of the official record. I would ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes or less. To help you with that time, there is a timing light at your table. When you have one minute left, the light will switch from green to yellow, and then finally to red when your five minutes are up. President Sharp, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the National Congress of American Indians, I thank you for holding today, this hearing today to discuss the impact of the tax code on tribal nations. I am Fawn Sharp, President of the Quinault Indian Nation and President of the National Congress of American Indians. Founded in 1944, NCAI is the oldest and largest representative organization serving the broad interests of tribal nations and communities. Congress has both a trust and treaty responsibility to ensure federal tax policy affords tribal nations the same opportunities as other governments to provide for their citizens. In 2017, Indian Country was left out of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which was the most significant change in federal tax policy in over 30 years. This omission was unjust because Indian Country has critical economic development needs and our tribal nations have been advocating for governmental parity and increased access to capital for decades. My testimony today will provide opportunity and important context to inform congressional decision making on tax policy affecting tribal nations and also several long-standing tribal tax priorities. There are 574 federally recognized tribal nations across the United States. Tribal nations are original members of the family of American governments and have a unique legal and political relationship with the United States as defined by US Constitution, treaties, statutes, court decisions, and executive orders. 
Through acquisition of land and resources, the United States formed a fiduciary relationship with tribal nations, whereby it is recognized as having a trust responsibility to safeguard tribal rights, lands, and resources. For the past 50 years, Congress has committed to supporting tribal self-determination and self-governance, which it has expressly recognized as including the development of tribal economies. As an exercise of self-governance, tribal nations provide for their citizens and surrounding communities governmental services ranging from emergency management and infrastructure to healthcare and transportation. Like all governments, the Supreme Court has recognized that the power to tax is an essential attribute of Indian sovereignty because it is necessary as an instrument of self-government and territorial management. Despite the Supreme Court's recognition of tribal taxing authority, taxation of economic activities on tribal lands is often subject to attempts by state and local governments to tax the same economic activity. This results in dual taxation and creates strong disincentives to invest in businesses on tribal lands. As a result, tribal nations often forego exercising their inherent right to tax in order to retain private investment on their lands. This forfeiture of vital revenue contributes to the distressed economic conditions that exist in many tribal communities and makes critical the generation of revenue through tribal economic development and achieving governmental parity under the tax code. Currently, the tax code does not provide tribal nations many benefits, incentives, and protections available to state and local governments. This disparity places tribal nations at a disadvantage when it comes to providing for the health, safety, and well-being of our communities. To begin addressing inequalities in the tax code and increase access to capital, Indian country has long asked Congress to pass legislation that provides at a minimum equity with state and local governments. My written testimony provides a list of Indian country priorities. Because I am nearing my time, however, I will highlight these examples of Indian country priorities that will promote tax parity for tribal nations. First, the adoption tax credit. Families that adopt special needs children in tribal court are ineligible for the adoption tax credit benefits available to families that adopt children and the same conditions in state courts. Next, the treatment of tribal foundations and charities. Charities funded or formed by tribal nations do not receive the same tax treatment as those funded or formed by state and local governments. This disparity makes it difficult for tribal nations to leverage resources to raise charitable donations from outside donors. Finally, child support enforcement programs. Unlike states, tribal nations do not have access to the Federal Income Tax Refund Offset Program, which authorizes the Department of Treasury to withhold from tax refunds amounts for past due child support payments. Tribal nations must have access to this critical support. In conclusion, thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to working with this committee to address the governmental disparities and economic development barriers impacting tribal nations under the tax code. See you, Quill. Thank you, President Sharp. President Danforth, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation to provide testimony to the Select Revenue Measures Subcommittee. <coughs> My name is Christina Danforth, Gwalagani, Niyungets, Otayuni, Niwage, Doloda, and I serve as the president of NAFOA. I'd like to thank Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Smith for your leadership of the Select Revenue Measure Subcommittee on Tribal Tax Reform. This hearing is a historic first for the subcommittee, and we are truly grateful for your efforts to support economic growth and development in Indian Country. Our dedication to serving Indian country's best interests is why we are advocating for legislative fixes to current tax regulations and capital incentive programs. The four represents the economic interests of over 120 of the 574 federally recognized tribes. The FOA's mission is to strengthen tribal finance and grow tribal economies by advocating for bipartisan policy solutions. Tribes have been pushing for comprehensive tax reform for decades, and necessary changes are long overdue. We hope that after today's hearing, the committee will have a better understanding of several obstacles that hinder tribal economies and detrimentally affect tribal welfare. 
we urge the committee to especially consider three structural reforms to tribal policy. Treaties signed between tribes and the federal government, judicial decisions and laws have determined that the federal government has a legal trust obligation to tribes. This trust obligation is defined as the federal government's responsibility to uphold tribal sovereignty and the right to self-governance. Congress has an obligation to meet the basic needs of tribes. Typically, this is done through the discretionary budget process. Each year, this gets more difficult, leaving education, health care, and housing needs underfunded and unmet. Failure to meet trust obligations has made Indian country economically distressed and disadvantaged. Congress can change these poor outcomes by adhering to the following three policy considerations. First, policy must conform to current tribal economic models. Tribal governments on federal trust lands making both collateral and property taxes unavailable, therefore limiting financing options. When developing policy, Congress must understand that asking for matching requirements, collateral sources, and revenue streams are ineffective for tribal economies. The second structural consideration for economic policy in Indian country is direct funding. Passing federal funds through states does not work. This process essentially places federal trust obligations, obligations upon the states, who often neglect the needs to meet um, the needs for tribes. The Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program is a perfect example of, of how funding pass-throughs have hurt Indian country. The Low Income Housing Tax Credit was established in 1986 to create greater incentives for the private market to invest in affordable housing. So far, only about 2,000 properties have been funded in Indian country. Limited financing options has led to severe rates of overcrowding, physical housing problems, and unaffordable housing. Congress can end this housing crisis by ensuring funding goes directly to Indian country. The third structural consideration is the ideal that the goal of economic policies is tribal self-governance. This can be accomplished by ensuring parity between tribal and state governments. Policies that do not acknowledge parity have inadvertently placed tribes at a disadvantage for tax credits and also limits tribal capacity for self-governance. A most egregious example of the governmental inequality would be tax exempt debt. Tribes can issue debt, but the debt is severely restricted by the essential governmental function test, a test that is not required of the state governments. Ensuring governmental parity for tribes will give tribes equal access to the tax exempt bond market and will provide greater access to more credit programs and financing. We cannot emphasize enough the importance of tax credits and their role for tribal governments. In conclusion, I would just like to say that Congress has an obligation to maintain the general welfare of tribes and cannot continue to neglect trust responsibilities by allowing current requirements to remain in place. The FOA highly encourages the Select Revenue Measures Subcommittee to, to consider the panel's recommendations as imperative for the economic growth and prosperity of Indian country. Tribal governments have been pushing for tribal tax reform for many decades and should not have to wait even longer for crucial change. Thank you for your time and consideration, Yawango. Thank you, President Danforth. Uh, now uh, I'll recognize Chairman Butler uh, for five minutes. Katapatas. Gui Kwasin, good morning. Uh, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the subcommittee, it is my pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Rodney Butler, and I am the Chairman of the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation, located in Mashantucket, Connecticut. Mr. Chairman, I'm aware this is the first tax hearing on tribal issues in over 25 years. This is both a surprising and concerning statistic. We sincerely appreciate your willingness to conduct this long overdue hearing and to hear from tribal leaders who are dealing with these issues on a daily basis. On a personal level, Chairman, I would say that uh, when we met back in September, along with Congressman Larson and Chairman Neal, and, and had the early discussion about having this hearing, um, you know, it was skeptical at, at, at best, given the, the conversations that tribal leaders have had with members of Congress about these important issues. Um, but you were sincere. Uh, Chairman Larson was sincere, and Chairman Neal was were sincere. And you felt that, and the fact that you followed up with this hearing proves that uh, you're truly committed to these issues, and, and we appreciate that. As you know, Indian country has presented a draft tax bill to this committee that has 
that addresses several important tax issues facing our communities. You will hear today a common thread in our requested testimony that tribes need to be treated fairly in the tax code. Quite simply, we're asking for parity in the federal tax code and to be treated as other sovereigns in this country, as reflected in the U.S. Constitution and numerous federal laws, treaties, and federal court decisions. Without question, tax parity for tribal governments will allow for greater self-determination, economic growth, and self-sufficiency in Indian Country. The purpose of my testimony today is to discuss the other tax issues that must be addressed by Congress, including dual taxation and tribal government pensions. These issues strike at heart of tribal sovereignty. Dual taxation, like all governments, sales taxes and personal property taxes are a critical source of government revenue for tribes. Under current law, states and tribes are allowed to tax non-tribal businesses that are conducting commerce on Indian reservation lands. This dual taxation has created significant economic harm to tribes across the country. Since 2013, the town of Ledger, Connecticut has aggressively assess and collect taxes on lease slot machines and personal property owned by non-Indian businesses on my reservation. We have worked diligently to diversify our economy and bring economic development to our reservation, including the opening of a Tanger Outlets at Foxwoods in 2015. However, instead of us collecting the tax revenue from this development, the town of Ledger has intrusively taxed these businesses despite the tribe providing all of the on-reservation governmental services and infrastructure. Furthermore, asserting our full taxing authority to find these services is economically infeasible because we do not want to expose our patrons, tenants, and vendors to double taxation, which would most certainly dampen on-reservation economic development. This inequity is further compounded by the fact that the diverted tax revenues from on-reservation businesses are used by state and local governments to serve non-Indian populations in neighboring communities rather than our citizens on our reservation. Now is the time for Congress to take immediate action to do away with this tax policy that severely undermines our sovereignty and economic growth and limits the ability of tribal governments to provide essential services to our members. On government pensions, another issue that has caused economic harm to the treatment of tribal government is government pensions under federal tax law. Unlike state and local governments, tribes are required to maintain two separate pension plans one for their employees who perform jobs deemed as essential government functions, and another for their employees who are part of a commercial enterprise that is wholly owned and operated by the tribe. This inequity ignores the fact that state and local governments have employees who work at commercial operations like state-owned uh, and operated lotteries, liquor stores, golf courses, banks, and other for-profit quasi-commercial ventures. While state and local governments may have one pension plan for all of their employees, Tribes must maintain separate plans for each category of workers. This disparity in the tax code places a significant financial and administrative burden on tribal governments. Some tribes, like mine, who have opted not to provide pensions because of this excessive burden, which ultimately hurts the people who would benefit the most, being our employees. We urge Congress to, ex to end this inequity in the tax code so tribes can operate one comprehensive government pension plan for all of our employees. We in Indian Country are pleased with this committee's interest to hold this hearing and draft legislation to address some of the most glaring discrepancies in the tax code. Passage of this bill will promote tax code fairness and economic development in Indian Country. Chairman and members of this committee, Katapatu Yamu, thank you for allowing me to testify today and for your attention to these issues. I encourage you to prioritize the passage of this legislation this year. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Butler. Now I'll recognize Chairman Khan for five minutes. Haku Kashua Shukin. Hello, good morning. Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Smith, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting tribal leaders to testify before you today. It is an honor to be here on behalf of the San Inez Band of Chumash Indians in the Santa Barbara, California area, where I serve as the elected chairman. A common theme you will hear today is the need to ensure parity between tribal governments and municipal, state and municipal governments in the federal tax code. Like local and state governments, tribal governments seek economic growth for the benefit of citizens and to support government services. However, tribal governments have struggled to access reliable financing and even tribes that can leverage revenues from natural resources, energy, or gaming lack access to many of the same tools that are available to our neighboring jurisdictions. 
In my view, the most critical piece missing from the Tribal Finance Toolbox is access to tax-exempt financing, which is widely used by state and local governments. Let me demonstrate the magnitude of this problem. From 1987 until 2010, tribal governments issued an average of about $157 million annually in tax-exempt bonds for a total of 321 tax-exempt projects worth about $3.76 billion. That represents less than one-tenth of one percent of the total tax-exempt projects during this period. What accounts for this overwhelming disparity? Unlike state and local governments, federal law subjects tribal governments to an essential government function test, or EGF, which essentially prevents the use of tax-exempt bonds for tribal projects which generate revenue. However, state and local governments are not bound by this restriction. They can and do use the exempt bonds for a wide array of economic development. In practical terms, this means that projects on tribal lands face substantial finance costs about 25 percent higher than identical state or local government projects. Every dollar paid in interest is a dollar which is not available for health care, education, or other services. Members of, of the committee, I'm here to ask that you take action to permanently level this playing field by removing the EGF restrictions. Recognizing the flaws of the EGF in 2009, Congress temporarily addressed this disparity by creating the Tribal Economic Development Bond Program. This program authorized tribal governments to issue $2 billion in tax-exempt debt for economic development and, importantly, did not subject the borrower, to, the borrower to the EGF. Implementation demonstrated the strong appetite for economic development in Indian country as tribes secured tax-exempt financing for about 50 projects. Nearly all outside urban areas, eligible projects must be located on tribal land and may not be casinos. My tribe was approved by Treasury to issue tax-exempt bonds to support construction of a new hotel and parking structure on our reservation, a project which has substantially improved our ability to provide services to our members. However, the program had several shortcomings. First and foremost, significantly, the $2 billion cap on tax-exempt debt has already been reached. As such, this program is, for all intents and purposes, defunct. Second, neither the authorizing legislation nor Treasury's regulations address whether these bonds maintained their tax-exempt status when refinanced. Despite existing guidance that allowed state and local governments to refinance, refinance tax-exempt debt, tribal tax-exempt debt became a ticking time bomb. Our tribe spent two years advocating for IRS guidance to ensure that our payments didn't balloon out of control after our initial borrowing term ended. Fortunately, and thanks to the help of many members of this committee, IRS finally issued guidance clarifying tribal bonds maintain tax-exempt status when refinanced, saving tribal governments across the nation tens of millions of dollars in finance costs each year. Ultimately, the committee should view the Tribal Economic Development Bond Program as a successful pilot for tax-exempt financing in Indian Country demonstrating that historic, historically underserved areas can carry out economic development with the right tools. Finally, in a, in a brief comment on the ability of tribes to offer private activity bonds, such bonds may only be used for tribal projects which meet essential government functions. No developer would ever accept this restriction as there would be no ability to recoup any investment. And this tool is almost never used for tribal projects. I hope this committee acts to ensure the tri that tribes have the ability to aid our members by using private activity bonds in the same manner as our state and local counterparts. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and, uh, and members of the subcommittee, as you examine ways to provide equal tax treatment to tribal governments, I hope that you will consider the repeal of essential government function tests. This antiquated restriction has been widely recognized as inequitable, and removing it would provide a valuable tool to attract investment in tribal communities, investment which is repaid by tribes' own revenues. Thank you for your consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chairman Kahn. I'll recognize Chairman Wiesaw for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the subcommittee, I am Matt Wiesaw, Chairman of the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians. Our tribe is very unique in that our reservation lands are located in two states. We have reservation lands in southwest Michigan, near New Buffalo, and in northern Indiana in the South Bend area. We are fortunate to have two members of Congress, Jackie Walorski and Fred Upton, who have been very supportive of our tribe and Indian country. 
We are especially grateful to Congresswoman Wolorski for her leadership on these tribal tax issues. I want to also recognize Congressman Dan Kildee, who has continued the good work of his uncle Dale Kildee in serving Indian country. The Pokagon Band has a long history in our region of the country. Our ancestors lived in the area for centuries and survived many hardships, including the Potawatomi Trail of Death in the mid-1800s, where so many of our people were forcibly removed from our homelands. In 1994, Congress reaffirmed the status of our tribe, and we began the long journey of reestablishing our homelands and building a future for our citizens. We were fortunate to establish successful gaming operation, which in turn funds our tribal government and provides for services and jobs to our people. Our tribe has constructed a tribal health center, housing for our citizens, and new buildings for our tribal court and police department. We have also established educational scholarships for our children. In 2007, we established Monoba Matson, the company to diversify and strengthen our tribal economy. Through Bonoba Matson, our tribe has built a network of self-sustaining trade and employment within our community. We have always maintained that it's important to give our citizens a hand up, not a hand out. And I think there is uh, true for all the tribal leaders and all the tribes in this country, same philosophy. And that means using all the tools available to help us provide economic opportunities for both our tribal citizens and for the non-native people that live in our communities. Today, we employ over 3,000 people in good-paying jobs with excellent health care and other benefits. But there's a limit to what the tribes can achieve as governments, as my tribal leaders have stated, because we operate in different circumstances than other governments in the American family and are treated unfairly when it comes to our treatment in the tax code. Tribal governments, unlike other forms of state, territorial, and local governments, do not have a tax base for which to raise funds because our land is not privately owned. Most tribal lands are held in trust by the federal government and cannot be encumbered. That is why it's especially important that we have other access to raise capital, other ways to raise capital. Yet we are often precluded from alternate opportunities to raise funds because of simple errors or drafting errors or omissions. The simple omission of the word tribal can and does bar us from participating in programs that we could use successfully. When many of these laws were written years ago, no one foresaw the need to include tribal governments in these programs. Today, many of these programs would provide real economic opportunity for our tribal nations. I want to thank you for your willingness to review and address these issues today. For our governments to function as efficiently as possible, I believe it is critical that tribes are treated the same as state, territorial and local governments in assessing capital markets, federal programs that would provide us with further economic opportunities on par with other governments. Whether it is creating access to new market tax credits or eliminating the burdensome essential government function criteria for tax-exempt bonds, Congress needs to take action to bring long overdue changes to the tax code to, the reflect, to reflect the times we live in today. Our tribe has experience in this area when we use TED bonds to finance a power plant and parking garage for a new hotel we are constructing in South Bend, Indiana. Since the TED bond provision has expired and the essential government function restricts the use of tax-exempt tribal government bonds, this could hamper our ability to pursue other economic development opportunities in the future. Indian country has come together behind common sense proposals that would begin to address these inequities in the tax code many of which have existed for decades. These issues are not partisan issues. They are simply issues of fairness. Again, we are simply seeking parity with other sovereigns in this country. In Indian country, we always strive to look at decisions we make today and how it would impact on the seven generations in the future. Congress, taking the steps to pass legislation that will help all of us in Indian country to provide a better quality of life for our citizens for generations to come is a good first step. Thank you for this opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions I can. Thank you, Chairman Wiesaw. Uh, we'll now uh, proceed under the five-minute rule with questions for the witnesses. I'll begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Chairman Khan, I'd like to start with you. Uh, help me understand the impact of economic development on tribal governments. 
How exactly do those types of projects benefit tribal members and not just the developers or the investors? Chairman, thank you for your question. Um, you know, m many tribes have challenges with, a, you know, the lack of having a tax base. Uh, so economic development is our way uh, to be able to fund important services like education, health care, general welfare, uh, and infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, so, so uh, having access to uh, reasonable financing, we're able to uh, fund those very important programs uh, to support our communities. Your testimony also stated that the borrowing costs of tax-exempt financing are substantially lower than taxable financing. What exactly does that lower cost mean in practical terms? And can you give us examples of projects you believe should have qualified, but which did not meet the essential government function threshold? I'd invite other panelists uh, to weigh in as well. So uh, for, for Chumash, you know, we, um, we save about $600,000 a year uh, when it, you know, because of tax, the, because of the TED bond program. Um, so being able to take advantage of that, we're able to put those dollars to work uh, in our community. Uh, as far as, um, you know, tax exempt bond, uh, bond access in other areas, you know, um, with, without that TED bond program, we weren't able to take advantage of it for use of uh, hotels or parking structures, convention centers, other, other uh, uh, developments similar to uh, what states and municipalities are able to do without having the restraints of the EGF. Any, anyone else have any examples? For the tax exempt um, bond opportunities, um, I agree, like uh, buildings such as hotels, um, parking structures, wastewater facilities, these are essential needs, but um, likewise, we have not been uh, afforded the opportunity to take um, advantage of tax exempt bonds. Um, it's been very difficult, and of course, the whole process to apply has been difficult, and a lot of times we're having to educate our, our financiers, and that also is a barrier as well. Thank you. In my opening statement, I mentioned how uh, uh, little tribal projects received in terms of the new markets tax credit uh, disbursements, uh, despite the clear need in Native American communities. Uh, Native American uh, areas in my home state received only $334,000 in investment over the course of the program, according to data compiled by the Joint Committee on Taxation. Several of you highlighted this disparity in your testimony. President Danforth, could you explain why tax credit programs like the New Markets Tax Credit are so critical to economic development in tribal areas? Um, one of the things that occurred is because some states have a lot of tribal populations and communities, so they would check the box saying, are you serving um, this population? It, it may not have been the case. For example, in um, Illinois, there are no tribes in Illinois, yet there are some um, <clears throat> allocations that were provided for projects, even though no tribes exist in Illinois. Um, another example would be, for example, in Rhode Island, um, there's only one tribe, um, the Narragansett, but no tribes have been funded in Rhode Island. Oklahoma is very broad, and again, the, when I was talking about um, people were just checking the box that they're serving tribal communities, um, they weren't necessarily doing that because it was a very broad definition and no uh, specific requirements were made to um, to label such activity. So is that what you meant when you said that the uh, low disbursement um, may be overstated? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'll now recognize Ranking Member Smith uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again to our witnesses here for sharing your uh, diverse perspectives. Um, in Nebraska, while our tribes have traditional tribal lands, some uh, other tribes also have a broad service area which might cover multiple counties or even cities like Lincoln and Omaha. Are there particular challenges we should address related to the larger service areas compared to tribes largely working within tribal lands as we address issues in the tax code? Anyone who wishes to respond? Ms. Sharp? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. I think it's important to understand uh, when we look at the, the dual tax question, 
uh, in the dual tax issue that when tribal nations exercise their taxing authority, it's not something that was given to us by either state governments or even Congress. It's an attribute of our inherent sovereign powers to raise critical, effective, and necessary revenues. And so when there's an intersection with uh, state and local governments, there is a responsibility, uh, a trust responsibility of Congress and uh, in, in some cases a treaty responsibility to ensure that we can exercise that full spectrum of tax authorities. And so when, when you look at a single tribe's ability to raise revenues, it's not only important to understand the, the nature of that ability to raise revenues, but also the scope of that uh, that authority. And so for some tribes, while we have relinquished vast areas of lands across this country, we've not relinquished our connection to those lands and our citizens' connections to those lands inside and outside of geographically defined and limited areas. And so when you look at the true authority of tribal taxing powers, it is an attribute of inherent sovereignty and anything that conflicts or restrict that is a direct a conflict with our inherent powers that Congress has a both a fiduciary responsibility and a trust responsibility to ensure that that authority is exercised without external interference from anyone. Okay, anyone wishing to add? Yeah, Congressman, I would just add that um, as, uh, as President Sharp had pointed out, we have responsibility to our citizens whether they reside on trust land or on fee land. Uh, and at Pequot, at Mashantucket, we only have 1,600 acres in trust. And we have over a thousand members that live in and around uh, Mash and Tucket, but all around the country as well, who are eligible for service, services, whether it be health care, education, and the like. And so uh, we are obviously extending those benefits out to all of them, and we need to keep them in mind when we're looking at the economies that we're building within the boundaries of Mash and Tucket, because it's not just serving those citizens who reside there. Okay. Any others wishing to comment? Uh, Ranking Member Smith, uh, uh, the Chumash are in a similar situation where the land base is small and our services uh, uh, are spread around broad areas. Um, and so, I mean, we're, we're in similar situation to the Pequots here, as, as Chairman Butler pointed out. Very good. Thank you. I appreciate uh, hearing your insight on that. Um, many of you have mentioned new markets tax credit. And I just wondered if any of you would add uh, or w wish to uh, express any changes that you might see as helpful to new markets moving forward, that, that tax credit policy that we have currently in place. Is there anything we could do to make it more effective uh, for you? Mr. Butler? Expanding and extending it, I mean, that's primarily uh, what would be the, the greatest benefit to that. And there's, again, there's limited opportunity that we've seen from it, um, and it has had limited success, but there's opportunity to, to build upon that, for sure. Okay. Anyone else? President I, Sharp? I would add, in looking at that as one example, uh, that demonstrates the, the role of inequities under the tax code. And so when you can look at the, the use by state and local governments of you know, tax credits and the success that they have in providing for their citizens versus the limited authorities we have. Uh, if we were treated equitably under the tax code, you would see just a tremendous growth and expansion of tribal economies, not only for the benefit of our citizens, but for the benefit of all surrounding communities. And so I think it's important when you consider those type of tax issues where there's a disparity between tribal nations and, and state and local governments, look at the success of state and local governments and what it can do versus the barrier that it presents to tribal nations, uh, communities where we desperately need those resources to provide for the health, safety, and welfare of our, our citizens. Okay. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Larson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Minutes. Chairman. And uh, I want to thank all the panelists again. Uh, <clears throat> As all of you know, the tax code currently allows tribal governments to issue tax-exempt bonds for projects that would customarily be performed by state and local governments through their taxing powers. This limitation limits development opportunities, and it is an example of the lack of parity in the tax code between tribes, state, and local governments. Chairman Butler. What projects would the Mashantucket Pequot tribe be able to undertake if their bonding authority was not limited 
by the essential government function test? Well, that's a, thank you, uh, Congressman. Uh, great question. And, and again, it really all goes back to parity and, and building our tribal economies, no different than a state or municip municipalities would. And so when you look at the projects that we're able to bond uh, tax exempt versus uh, because of the essential government function test versus what state and municipalities are able to, and at Mashantucket, we can do tax exempt uh, bonding for roads and infrastructure projects, our sewer treatment plant, whereby the neighboring communities, they can actually raise funds for such things as, 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 as extreme as a stadium, uh, a hotel, conference centers, and the like. And when you think about the economies that we've created uh, that, that have centered around uh, resort uh, destinations, the opportunity to expand upon those uh, and, and broaden the reach of, uh, of, our, of our resorts, that therefore then generate revenue that, that, that fuel um, the government service that we provide. And not only fuel the government service that we provide, but the impact that our economies have on the surrounding economies. And we, we often talk about the impact of what Foxwoods had in not only southeastern Connecticut, but all over Connecticut. Right. Um, I was uh, testifying uh, yesterday in the Public Safety uh, Committee uh, up in Connecticut, and I, I do have to say, Congressman, we need to step up our game back home, right, because our chambers don't look anything like this, <laughs> right? Um, but that being said, I was speaking with one, one of the senators uh, at the hearing, and he was saying that uh, although he lives in the western part of the state, uh, he's a real estate agent, and one of the first homes that he sold was to a future employee of Foxwoods almost 100 miles away. And so it shows you the impact that we have when we build st our strong uh, economies on our reservations, the impact that it has, not just for us, but for the surrounding region. Would any of the other, anyone else like to comment on that? Ms. Danforth? Sure, you know, I agree that, you know, we need to have the flexibility and the parity that the states enjoy. You know, even projects like wastewater treatment plants, um, solar projects, hotels, of course, um, those are things that could um, benefit our communities, um, even parking lot facilities. So if we had the same opportunities, it would open um, not only the opportunity to serve our communities and create revenues for necessary services as healthcare and education, um, it would also create jobs. And so, you know, the essential um, um, governmental function test really does need to um, be amended or withdrawn or again that that's the whole issue about parity is why is it okay for the state but not okay for the tribal community to participate in these types of financial op opportunities for financing we hear you uh, loud and clear with respect to um, uh, parity uh, chairman uh, Butler uh, is there anything else that uh, you might be able to shed light on on how the tax code could further encourage economic development. Uh, we're always concerned here in the Ways and Means Committee about economic growth and understand the value added that that creates, uh, as you've given in your first example. Well, uh, thank you, Congressman. You know, when you think about dual taxation, I think all of us had touched on at some point, you can liken those to, to tariffs, right, and what they're doing, uh, what they're intended to do uh, to other world economies. That's what you're seeing uh, here in the United States with, with tribal economies. And so an example of that would be um, we have limited ability to provide tax incentives for business development because we have the outside municipalities or state asserting the same taxes. So again, by way of example, at Mashantucket, uh, when I referenced earlier, earlier that we built a, uh, a Tanger Outlets facility, it's a $140 million investment by a third party into our, our lands at Mashantucket. Um, which we were able to work through uh, through the Hearth Act, and in fact, uh, because it's because it was real property as opposed to personal property, and so the the, the building itself is not subject to uh, real property taxes, but all of the tenants inside are subject to personal property taxes and sales tax, retail sales taxes through the state, and we do about 100 million dollars a year in retail sales in that facility alone. And that the 8% sales tax that, the, that Connecticut is, is asserting on our patrons, that's $8 million a year that are leaving the, the, the lands at Mashantucket that could be going towards, uh, again, critical services that we provide to our nation and reinvestment uh, into other economic development activities that could then spur more growth and more jobs for the region. My time has expired, but I just wanted to thank you again, and I wanted to thank uh, uh, we saw as well for mentioning uh, Dale Kildee, because he doesn't get mentioned often enough in this committee. Thank, thank you. Um, Mr. Rice, you're recognized for five minutes.
Mr. Butler, I'd like to follow up on that questioning that you were just talking about. You said that the Tanger Outlet uh, Retail Center is not subject to property taxes? Right. So Why is that? So, in, in fact, we, we take pride in being pioneers uh, in federal legislation. So there was actually a Mashantucket leasing law uh, that was enacted that said that if we partnered with, you know, with a large capital investment, um, a third party on reservation lands, we could enter into a long-term lease and it, would, and it wouldn't be subject to uh, local uh, uh, property taxes. So the local jurisdictions worked with you to, to exempt that property from... No, <laughs> and no. Uh, it took some educating, and it, and it wasn't an easy uh, fight. Uh, there were lawsuits that were filed because, again, they had been so used to uh, exerting taxes um, uh, through the state on our lands, whether it was on the physical property and personal Well, is property. there some state law that allows that to be exempted? No, and that's that's because... So how was it exempted? Because there must of, not be double tax if what you're saying is true. I agree. Well, because... because the, the federal law is so vague, and that's what we're talking about here in clarifying. And the Congress has that authority. Uh, the Cotton Petroleum case that was went through the Supreme Court actually said Congress has the authority to address the taxation issues uh, in, between tribes and states. Uh, and so that's part of what we're asking. But because that's not clear, the states uh, outside of outside of venues uh, legislation like IGRA, which is a great example of where it does work. So you litigated this. We litigated. And you found, and you ultimately won, and there is no double taxation. Not on that specific issue. So all it does is it moves on to the next time. So because they can't tax the physical <laughs> property, they go inside to each tenant and they assess taxes on all the personal property of each tenant. All right. Um, and then you said that the, the state still taxes the retail sales. Retail sales, yes. And you would like to exempt or maybe you would like to tax it yourself. Well, so here's a great example of, of dual taxation. Are, are other retail centers in that area that are not on the reservation exempt from sales tax? No, no, but they're also in Connecticut. So we don't go into Connecticut and apply Mashantucket sales tax to a Connecticut. Because I have so limited time, I can't really go into this into tremendous detail. The low income housing credit, if, if you're saying you want direct allocation, how would you want that done? Would you want it done by population? Is that what you're looking at? And only for people on the reservation? Is that what you're looking at? That would be Ms. helpful. Ms. Sharp? That would be helpful. Ms. Sharp? Yes. I, so just, for, just based on population and only for people living on the reservation? I, I, Your microphone's not on. No, I think it's for... Excuse me. All of our all of our citizens, uh, whether they live on or off the reservation, but we do. Uh, I don't know. I don't understand how that would work. I mean, if you got a couple that lives a thousand miles away from the reservation, and you're going to allocate some low income housing credit to them. No, within within our area right now, we have at Quinault, we have a thousand residents that live on the reservation, but it's it's highly. I mean, it's challenging to build any sort of infrastructure. I would, I would think the credit, if you yes. did that, would be so minuscule that it wouldn't matter. I mean, if you got a one big reservation with lots of people, then I, I can see how it would make a difference. But if you're talking about most of these 546 recognized tribes are pretty small, right? Right. I, I would think that if you did a direct allocation best based on population, it would be minuscule. It wouldn't really matter. I want to move on to one other thing, and that and that is um, in South Carolina. You know, probably due to no, certainly due to decades and decades and decades of discrimination, there are very very few recognized you know tribes. There's certainly a, a significant population that is Native American, and you know we have this requirement of proving history to get recognized, but I don't know that that's really, I don't know why it has to be so tribe-centric anymore. I mean, we got DNA, we can prove who's a Native American, right? It's not that hard. So do y'all have any suggestions for the vast number of South Carolinians that are not in a, in a recognized tribe? Is there any suggestion for parity for those people? Because I really do worry about those people. And a lot of those people live in poverty, and they don't get any of these tribal benefits that y'all are talking about. Do you have any 
Do you have any recommendations for those folks? You know, there are tribal people in neighborhoods that are Native American and urban populations, and there needs to be consideration for that as well. Sometimes we get clumped together, but even on the the low-income housing tax credit, it's, it's difficult to build homes because you need infrastructure and then you need the financing and then you need the operational costs after that. And so um, we're, we need extra credit for the things that we're doing. And even if you have a small population, it doesn't mean that the building costs any less. And so that's important. I think the other thing that um, from an educational standpoint is sometimes um, we do have tribal members on or near the reservation and some of that land within the reservation boundary is fee land. But it still applies that there is still a need. Like in at Oneida, for example, there are 400 people on the housing waiting list. There's, there's, we just don't have the capacity to, to build enough homes. And a lot of times it depends on the relationship with that community, with that state, um, the education, um, so that they understand that we're, we're trying to provide a basic essential need of housing. I would thank love you. to continue this conversation, but my time has long expired, so thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sanchez, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank um, the, our thoughtful witnesses for joining the panel today and giving us testimony. Um, our committee is long overdue for a hearing on tribal tax provisions, so I'm pleased that uh, the chairman has seen <coughs> fit to change that by starting out with um, a discussion today. Um, chairman Kahn, part of your written testimony focused on the disparity in borrowing costs of tax-exempt financing between tribes and other municipalities. And in the coming months, I think that our committee is going to be spending a substantial amount of time trying to craft a really robust infrastructure package. And so with that in mind, I'm hoping that we can begin addressing the discrepancy for tribes so that they can share in, you know, the uh, benefit of infrastructure projects. Um, so again, I want to thank you for your testimony today on that particular issue. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the issue of adoption, of adoption tax credits. Um, President Sharp and President Danforth, during your testimony, you explained that tribal families can't access the adoption tax credit for certain tribal adoptions of special needs children. Can you please elaborate on that issue and share any examples of how the current law has really impacted tribal families? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. I, I could actually speak to that issue from personal experience. Uh, I adopted three children out of the Oregon foster care system. Uh, they, their grandmother was taken out of Alaska during the scoop policy in the 1950s. Their mother ended up in foster care and then I adopted uh, the children um, through the Indian Child Welfare Act. I was able to uh, see that those children could return back to a tribal community. And when I was asked the question of where should the adoption take place, I was given the, the choice of going through tribal court at Quinault or state court. And I opted to uh, conduct the adoption through state court because of that barrier, because a, a tribal court order on adoption does not meet the requirements uh, under the code for the adoption tax credit. So we were forced effectively to go through a state process because the availability and options through tribal court are not recognized. Okay, interesting. I appreciate um, that testimony. Um, it, it's interesting to me that if we have the goal of making sure that children can be adopted, uh, we ought to make uh, it easier uh, financially and otherwise um, for folks who want to go through that process and have um, tribal courts on equal footing with state courts where adoption is concerned. Um, I think, if you wouldn't mind, uh, yes. I think another issue in regards to adoption um, tax credit is the definition of special needs. I think if um, the tribal, like she said, the tribal system has a, a definition or um, what makes up a special needs of students or young people, that that needs to be recognized. We need to have our definition of special needs recognized by the state courts as well. You know, I work at a public high school back home and you know, even trying to get kids tested for special needs is, is a huge barrier. And it's sure. like, they don't wanna do the paperwork, you know, or they don't have time, they say they're overworked, but sometimes they just don't want to um, come into the communities and, and start to educate themselves on what special needs are. I think it's especially difficult because we have a lot of blended family situations as, as Fawn had, had described. And 
I myself came through the foster care system um, late in, in my teenage years, but thankfully there was an Indian family that would take me, but you know, again, you, you have to go through that other system. So it's almost like another parody with the definition of special needs to recognize our special needs considerations for tribal communities. Sure, that's, that's certainly an issue, not, not treating tribal court definitions or, or orders yeah, on, on parity with state. Um, finally, President Sharp, um, during your testimony, you explained that tribes are subject to different treatment than states when they establish charities. Um, do you have examples of tribal charities, and can you explain why tribes would be interested in creating these charities or supporting organizations? Yes. Thank you. So it's important to understand that an attribute of inherent tribal sovereignty is raising revenues through systems of taxation. And when that is limited, as uh, was discussed by many here through the decades and through many court decisions, we are then forced to try to make profits through commercial enterprises. And that's what you're seeing happening. Now, we don't have any business certainty to even do that because when we invest millions of dollars into these commercial projects, counties and states come in and effectively invade that finite economic pie that exists within tribal communities. That is a, the problem of dual taxation. Now, to further try to close that gap, we look to charitable uh, contributions, to partnerships. There's many philanthropy organizations inside and outside the United States that understand the plight of tribal nations and they want to seek to help. But because of the, the limitations and the barriers and the unfair treatment under the tax code with respect to even charitable contributions, that is a third layer of limitation. Thank you so much for your testimony. I appreciate it. Thank and you, Mr. Time. Swiker. You're recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And for some of my fellow members here, um, this is actually one of the issues I've cared about a lot. I, I've lived most of my life alongside um, tribal lands, and um, even as a young man in the state legislature, um, it, uh, I actually co-chaired the Indian, Indian Affairs Committee. And the one thing I learned is how little I knew, um, that um, issues on tribal lands are compl complex. And when you're from Arizona, when you have, you know, what, 21 tribe, or 22 tribes, 21 with land, and the, and the differences. Um, uh, Chairman Khan and Chairman Wiesel, um, both of you sort of touched on a part of the conversation and of more than just fixing LIHTC, the ability to do low-income um, tax-exempt bondings and some of these mechanisms. How, how far is the discussion with you and, and some of your experts around you been in, would there be ever a way to do something more holistic, saying when we write statutes, and often it, it, we're dealing with incredible complications, which are sometimes trying to move very fast, to make sure that tribal lands are treated similar to other types of municipalities. Do you see something like that as helping solve um, um, this problem? Um, uh, Chairman Wiesaw first. Uh, just one quick response, and it goes to a question that uh, Congressman Larson asked earlier on the essential government function. For the Pokagans, um, there are a couple of buildings that we would have liked to have built, but they would serve a dual purpose, both a government function, but yet there would be some gaming um, use for it too. So it, it, it was disqualified. So I think, as you've heard, I think from everybody, the elimination of the essential government function would just, would, would be tremendous. And would, it, would it be basically putting um, the identical definition that the municipality across the street gets to live with um, also for tribal lands? I, I believe so. You, you could do something as simple as uh, the example of a golf course. Municipality can build a golf course, but we can't. Um, um, Chairman Khan, you actually spoke directly to this uh, in your opening statement. Um, would trying to come up with a more universal definition help solve these problems universally? Well, well the, some of the experience that we've challenged uh, or been challenged with, um, you know, a, a museum. Uh, we tried to, uh, um, you know, use tax exempt uh, funding for a museum, but we weren't able to get the project off the ground fast enough. But also, it wasn't uh, the land. It took us 14 years to put it into trust. So. Um, I think, I think you talked about uh, some sort of collaboration, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, 
um, on reservation, off reservation. I think for us, that's a specific challenge. And for many tribes in California, it's, it's a challenge yeah. because, you know, our, our lands are either checkerboarded um, or, or they're inadequate. And so, you know, finding some sort of collaboration that we could do where whether it's a museum or a clinic or, or other, um, uh, you know, other government programs, um, you know, on or near uh, or within a certain boundary around the reservation. Well, and, and that's something um, particularly we deal with in, in the, my tribal communities. I have one incredibly sophisticated Salt River Pima Maricopa, um, high quality management, great commands and controls, but they also have tribal lands and then they have a Lati issue, uh, Lati lands and sometimes you, you end up with um, uh, conflicting issues, conflicting mechanisms, um, financing opportunities. Um, the other thing I, I, I have, and, and this may not be the perfect place to do it, is how do we also deal with sort of the um, issues of, of the disparity? My suburban tribes are very sophisticated. If you're in Arizona, I also have some very small, very remote, that are in really rough shape. Um, how, what would you do to help them? Congress, Congressman, I would say that what we're looking to do through uh, this proposed legislation to create parity would allow them to seek economic development outside of gaming, right? And so the, the benefit of gaming has been tremendous to those tribes that are, like myself, we're perfectly situated between New York and Boston, right? It's an incredible market, but there's, there's tribes in, in Montana and in, in Northern California and what Arizona. have you, in Arizona, that don't have access to those populations, but that's the only carve out that the federal government has allowed them to invest in freely. <clears throat> and so opening up the vehicles where they can look at other economic opportunities, again, eliminating the essential government uh, function test would allow them to raise capital that they could invest in other economic development outside of gaming. And, and I know we're up against time, uh, Mr. Chairman, this issue means a lot to me, but I think it also means a lot to Arizona. And I, I wish we could also do some sort of roundtable type discussions because the levels of complications, the levels of different way, um, certain treaty obligations, the way different um, tribal communities are functioning their constitutions, uh, it would be healthy for us all to get our head around what we can do to actually create some fairness and parity. Thank and you. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Swickert. Uh, now, consistent with committee practice, we'll now move to a two-to-one question uh, ratio, and I'll recognize uh, Ms. Del Baney for five minutes to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of our witnesses for um, sharing your thoughts with us today. Um, in some states, like my home state of Washington, tribes have been able to access the low-income housing tax credit, um, but in many states, that's not the case. In fact, according to the Joint Committee on Taxation, 80% of low-income house tech, tax credit housing in Indian country, 80% um, are located in five states, um, Alaska, Alabama, Oklahoma, North Carolina, and Washington State. Um, but it doesn't include North Dakota, South Dakota, Arizona, or Montana, where there are large reservations um, with large tribal communities with high poverty rates and severe housing shortages. Um, I believe this is because state agencies award credits um, and under current law are not required to consider affordable housing needs of Native Americans when they are awarding those credits. Um, I have legislation, the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, which would make the housing credit more accessible to tribes and also bring more resources to develop projects serving extremely low income populations, which tribes could take advantage of. And President Danforth, you've been, you brought up the low income housing tax credit and um, the concerns that, the, about access for tribes. Um, what would the impact be to tribes if Congress passed legislation like mine, which includes a provision to include tribal nations in the qualified allocation plan selection criteria? Um, I think it would benefit us. Can you turn your mic on? Sorry, yeah. There. I think it would benefit tribes tremendously. Um, a lot of the tribes are still isolated from a rural standpoint, and the infrastructure is a huge need. And so the low income housing tax credit will help, but I think there also has, I, I, if you make it a qualifier, it also helps because sometimes there's not a relationship between the tribes and the state. And it all depends on the education process. And you know, I've been in tribal government for 18 years and it's always a re-education process. You get, you know, you changes in, 
and congressional members and Senate members, and then you have to go back and re-educate, re-educate. Um, and, and that in itself takes time. So if you, if you make it a, a qualifier, then that really helps us to get over that one barrier. Mm -hmm. But then yeah, and again, there, it, it becomes complex because of the land status as well. Yes, and we, um, what, we would also modify the definition of difficult development areas to include tribal areas in my legislation. Um, would that also be helpful? Tremendously helpful, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, um, it's a very, we have a large bipartisan support there, so we will keep pushing hard. Um, tribal economic development is obviously critical, and to um, continue to make sure we have strong economic development, we need small businesses, innovation, um, entrepreneurship. And so President Sharp, I know you, this has been an important issue for you. Uh, um, should the Indian Employment Tax Credit be expanded to promote Indian entrepreneurship? Uh, thank you for that question. Yes, absolutely. Uh, when one looks at a tribal economy, it is so much more than tribally owned business. It's so much more than the inherent authority tribes have to raise taxes. It's also important that we build a private sector economy. If you look at the United States, much of the economy is driven by small businesses. And we have barriers, including access to capital. And so any policy that will support the micro-sovereignty of our tribal citizens to empower them and to create a path out of poverty and to create a path where their hard, dedicated work to provide for our communities, uh, that, would, that would go a long way to help build our tribal economies because there is a finite economic pie within our reservation borders. And if our tribal citizens can be uh, lifted up and provided incentives and opportunities to grow their own families and build the economy to contribute to not only our communities, but the surrounding communities, that would be very helpful and very effective. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you um, one more quick question with our remaining time. The General Welfare, Welfare Exclusion Act of 2014 was important legislation to protect Indian people from federal taxation of their tribal benefits. And I supported that and was happy to, but unfortunately an oversight in the law has led to other federal agencies like Social Security Administration to include general welfare benefits as income for benefits eligibility purposes. Um, so President Sharp, should Congress act to protect all federal benefits from being diminished when tribal governments provide general welfare benefits to their citizens? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, just having a technical amendment uh, that would clarify that those benefits are excluded from income tax in other areas would go a long way because many of those who are the most vulnerable, including our elders who are eligible for general welfare benefits, they're also re recipients of Social Security, SNAP, and it creates a, a double problem for those tribal citizens, those most vulnerable citizens that we hope to provide for the general welfare. On the one hand, we're helping them, but on the other hand, they're being penalized, and that's just not right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank um, you I yield back, much. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Moore, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. 25 years since we've had a hearing on Native issues, and so I feel like I'm under a lot of pressure to in include this entire discussion, Mr. Chairman, unless it's going to be 25 more years. I don't have, I don't think I got that much time. Um, we're going to have to do this again. Thank you so much for coming. Um, let me just uh, start out with uh, you, Madam President uh, Danforth. So glad that you're here. Uh, not only have you been the former chairwoman of the Oneida tribe, but you're the president of the board of the Native American Financial Officers Association. You serve as the director of the Native American Bank. So I know that you know how to attract capital for some of these projects. You made it very clear in your testimony today. Uh, I think you were, your testimony was awesome. You talked about the matching requirements uh, and having, not having property taxes, not being able to meet those as, a, as an obstacle. Um, as your f first point, your third point, which has been repeated uh, by many of the, the panel, uh, talking about the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the essential government functions test that is unfair. But one thing I really wanted to lean into a little bit more um, was your a statement that pass-throughs just do not work. Uh, and you gave an example of the low-income tax credits. Um, and I am wondering if that's also the case for the CDEs. 
And when you were responding to Ms. Delbaney, you talked about the relationships between state governments and the tribes, and this being a constant educational process. So I'm wondering, a piece of legislation that we have heard from CDEs in my office, and we have pounded them about why you don't get more allocations for these programs, and they have sworn that it's because of their ignorance and not understanding what's going on in tribal land. So other than the box that they check, would it be helpful to have some sort of specific allocation to provide technical assistance to these CDEs to make sure that they work with tribal uh, uh, entities to, to, so that they could fit in? Um, yes, it would be helpful. Anything that you can do to help qualify tribes, anything you can do to help um, clear the path for direct funding is always very helpful because you know state governments are busy just as any government is and sometimes they're not in tune to some of the specific needs and the variables and the demographics of tribal communities and they vary from tribe to tribe. So anything that you can do to help make those pass-throughs go away and that there be direct funding um, will always be beneficial. Um, we know there's still some responsibility that goes through that, that, um, that we have to provide when we get those funding sources, but I think if you could see that it will help eliminate the lengthy process and the lengthy application requirements that sometimes we just can't meet for whatever reasons. Um, you are helping some of the, the more poor rural communities and um, even those that are close to urban areas, they still have to serve those urban populations as Oneida does very often. We even yeah. serve people as far as Milwaukee in, in your district. So That's right. the need is, is very um, encompassing. And so whatever you can do to help us get fast-track funds is always beneficial. We're going to work on that. Listen, I, um, I have been so engaged with, uh, uh, with issues in Indian land. I'm so glad that my colleagues, uh, Deb Holland and Sharice, Davids have uh, have joined our group. I looked at them on in inaugural day thinking how nice they looked and how happy they were and saying they must not realize how much work this is. Um, but I have, um, I've introduced a companion bill to the House on Senator Udall's Indian Health Services Health Professions Tax Fairness Act to make sure that we uh, get uh, uh, loan repayment and tax exempt programs for Native Americans. Representative Cole has agreed to be my co-sponsor there. We, we've been working on new market tax credits to end some of the barriers there, put stuff in the committee's package for the Green Act um, to uh, uh, support sustainable energy projects for Tribal Communities Act. Uh, and also, for the record, Mr. Chairman, um, I uh, have worked really hard on the kitty tax, which uh, was uh, an error uh, made we think in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. So for the record, uh, would you, can I ask unanimous consent to place in the record uh, a letter from, um, um, to uh, Mitch McConnell and, and Schumer? Without objection. Uh, from all of these tribes for the National Congress of American Indians, uh, a resolution, the National Indian Gaming Association, a resolution, the United South and Eastern Tribes Incorporated. Um, supporting um, me and Mr. Estes' legislation to end the uh, kitty tax, and I yield back. Without objection, such will be the order. Mr. LaHood, you're recognized for five minutes to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to welcome the witnesses here today, and thank you for your valuable testimony. I represent Central, West Central, and I don't have any tribes, and um, uh, frankly, before coming into the hearing, I uh, didn't know much about uh, these fiscal issues and these tax issues as it relates to uh, the hearing we're having today, uh, but have learned an awful lot. And uh, I know we're not here to talk about the past, but obviously when you look at the difficulties and struggles that tribes have had as it relates to poverty and other opportunities, uh, those need to be addressed. And so I think uh, the subject matter of today's hearing is important. And as we think about how do we let the private sector flourish, uh, in, uh, on tribal lands, uh, you know, uh, and we look at the public policy issues related to that, uh, it's important that we look at how do we remove those barriers and the prohibitive measures that are in place uh, that we, we free up um, the free enterprise system to incentivize growth and prosperity. And uh, so I'm intrigued by a number of the 
discussion areas that we've had today. And when we look at public policy initiatives, we look at tax changes, look at uh, statutory provisions that, that we can implement. I, I'll start with Mr. Weesaw. We, we've heard a lot today on different provisions. I was wondering if you could prioritize um, from your point of view, uh, what, 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 what do we start with at the top and how do we work down? Um, I, I think starting from the top probably differs with, uh, with each tribe to, to go back. For us, we're, we're kind of a small tribe, you know, neighboring to, uh, to your state. Um, the essential job function is, is critical, I think, to eliminate. The, uh, the tax credits, I think, are important. Um, we have, uh, it, it, there isn't a day that goes by that somebody doesn't come with us, come to us with a great idea. Um, all we need is your money. Um, we, we need to change that so that their tax credits are there for these companies that, or these individuals that have these great ideas can have access to that, that money also. So it's not always the tribe that has to fund these ideas where at the end of the day when it falls apart, it's the developer that, that walks away with, uh, with, with the money. So I think the tax credits, uh, reinstituting that, getting rid of the, um, the essential job function, I, I think would go, uh, would, would go a long way. Like I said earlier, we've got some things that we could do at our tribe, but because the buildings would serve dual purpose, uh, that we're not eligible to do that right now. We're, we're sitting on... Um, the ability to access $30 million of TED bonds that we just can't, we just can't access it right now. Um, so I, I think that would be a start. But again, I think each tribe is probably a little bit different. And is there anyone else that shares uh, that same view that the tax credit issue would be the top priority? You know, I think uh, Chairman Wiesel said it appropriately. Based on each tribe's situation, right, generally they're going to have different priority lists, but, and that's why narrowing it down to those top three I think really encapsulate the, the, the bulk of the opportunity that we see in front of us. And, and really to put a bow on it would be the dual taxation issue. And I know that's the most complicated issue, um, but that solves a lot of these issues uh, globally, um, in addition to going into the micro issues of, of the TED bonds and everything else. Thank you. Um, I may switch topics here to Ms. Danforth. I know you mentioned that there are no tribes in Illinois, but there's an allocation in Illinois. Can you just talk a little bit about what that means in terms of an allocation, and is there a legal obligation that comes with that, or is there statutory requirements that go along with that? Well, I, I wouldn't know for sure if there's a statutory requirement for that, but that's something we can look into for sure, unless one of my colleagues are more familiar with that. Um, but I think part of the difficulty is, is there's no requirement for, for definition or qualifiers around um, those um, tax credits. And so um, I know the examples I used was um, for the new market tax credit specifically is that, you know, while some communities, when they are applying, the application basically just says, are these um, qualifiers in your region, in your project? And yeah, there's a, a ton of tribes in Oklahoma, for example. And so they could say yes. In Illinois, uh, maybe in the urban populations, there's some tribal communities. There's a definitely, you know, American Indian um, organization in Chicago, but, you know, maybe people don't really understand what they're doing when they apply and, and make those considerations. I don't know what the check and balance is on that particular um, issue. Um, I don't know who reviews applications. I don't know, you know, specifically. Um, so anyways, when Treasury changed the application and the general, uh, the essential government function test, you know, comes into play for, for different tax exempt issues, and I know I'm jumping around, but um, it's kind of difficult because the uniqueness of tribes and the uniqueness of where we exist. So I apologize. Thank you, Ms. Danforth. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Byer, do you wish to inquire? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman Kahn, a 2011 report from the Department of Treasury regarding the Tribal Economic Development Bond Program found that the limited initial use of the program is due more to tribes facing challenges in securing credit and not the tax implications of access to capital. Do you agree with this conclusion? Yes. A any notions about 
So, because here we are, we're a tax subcommittee or special select revenue measures. Um, so we're looking at tax implications. What can we be doing to help with access to credit in general? Well, I mean, uh, you know, tax parity is really important to us, and 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 really, uh, act, you know, making it easier access for for tribes. And um, I know, you know, tribes are, tribes are unique, and, and depending on our geographic area or the size, um, you know, we have a lot of a lot of different challenges. But uh, in all, we've been fighting for for many years, you know, to be recognized as governments, and and I think that's our primary uh, uh, primary. Focus is is really to uh, uh, you know be able to have the same access that uh, states and municipal governments have. Great, great. Thank you, Ms. Danforth. Um, we talk housing here a lot. We're seven million housing units short in America. We had a pr presentation yesterday that showed we're we're losing another three hundred thousand housing units falling behind every year. So I think most of us are enthusiastic co-sponsors of Susan Del Bene's Bill to increase the low-income housing credit, so 50% credit, 550,000 more units. And she has the bill specifically on allocation criteria, but can you discuss the problem with a bit more specificity? Are there other changes that are going to be needed in order to apply these federal housing programs to the challenges of Native Americans? Um, you know, one of, one of the the background things on the low-income housing tax credit was to attract private market investors. And so I don't know if there's a way to, to continue that or to expand that or to, again, it does go back to um, the ability for them to understand the value of that. So when, if you can get investors to, to come in, developers to come in, um, because it, it kind of goes back to what Fawn was saying earlier is, what if you get into an issue of disagreement? You know, if in, you know, tax credits are important, and so we want to invite people to come in to understand our communities so that they will invest in our communities. So I don't know if I could offer something specifically. Maybe my colleagues can. Um. Yes, please. Yes, sure. I think it's important to understand tax policy not only as a tool to assist tribal nations in raising essential government revenues, it's also a tool to provide incentive for behaviors that we want to encourage and a disincentive for behaviors that we want to discourage. I think one of the fine examples of tribal nations and our ability to enter into uh, uh, partnerships with state and local governments or public-private partnerships, we have to be creative in looking at tax policies to encourage those things. There was an example of the Mississippi Band of Choctaws who entered into an MOU with uh, a local county. They could not issue industrial development bonds to build a manufacturing facility, but because they entered into that agreement, they were able to provide a path for access to capital. And if Mr. Smith were here, that was one of the areas I wanted to explore just a bit in terms of the low income housing tax credits. We have a housing shortage, both for our citizens on the reservation and off the reservation. But if we look at tax policy in a creative way to meet the needs of our citizens, whether they live on or off the reservation, as well as creating incentives for state and local governments who too are suffering from shortages, there's, a, there's many examples of where we can do that creatively rather than just looking at tribal tax policy in a vacuum in areas where we can enter into creative partnerships to lift up the entire county and communities. Those are things that I would highly encourage this committee to look at. We have a very clear vision on how to close the gap on economic development, on housing, on all of these other attributes of our inherent powers to not only raise revenues, but to, to uh, spur ec economic development and housing. I think you... you put your finger on a very important part of this. The existing low-income housing tax credit is completely used up every year, and often used up early in the year. So I have many associates who are building low-income housing who would do a lot more if the tax incentives were there. And then the, the key question is, can we make sure that we're also doing it to serve the, the Native American population? And, and I would just add to that, simply doing nothing is not an option. So either support tribal nations in our bid to increase housing, and if we can't do that, let's look at partnerships where it is uh, politically possible and, and everyone has that need. 
Thank, Thank you. you very Mr. much. Chair, your time has expired. Mr. Swazi, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all the witnesses for taking the time to be here today, the time that you're putting in, the preparation that you did to come here. We appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm really not educated on these issues. I don't have Native American tribes in my uh, districts. I, I have the Shinnecock tribe nearby, out of the east end of Long Island. Uh, as I mentioned to uh, Mr. Butler earlier, I dealt with the Pequots years ago when I was the mayor of my hometown related to a ferry service. Uh, and I used to go to a, some, a Native American sweat lodges on occasion, which is really cool. <laughs> uh, but I want to get more involved in these issues. And I've been speaking with my colleague, uh, Congressman Kind, about his bill, uh, which is the Tribal Tax and Investment Reform Act of 2019, which I'm sure he's going to speak about it. But are you familiar with his bill? Yes. Ms. Sharp? Are you, do you think it would help, help move this process forward? Yes, absolutely. And I would invite anyone uh, not having experience or directly engaging on these issues, uh, come out to Indian Country and visit us. Look at the policies that are articulated there and uh, talk with tribal leaders, engage, see on the ground implications of how those policies could help. I think it would go a long way to not only educate you in terms of good public policy in the sphere of taxation, you will see a little bit of effort go a long way to improve people that have been marginalized economically, socially, and politically for far too long. Are any of the other of you familiar with the, the bill? Or want to comment on it? Yeah, no, we're we're very supportive. I mean, uh, Congressman Kine has been uh, has been working on this for some time, and we appreciate that effort. And all of these add up, right? I mean, it's, there's no single solution to some of the tax and financing issues that we're dealing with in Indian Country. Um, and so the the separate bills and separate committees, they actually are helpful on, on their own right. And I just you know we're, when we were talking earlier, Congressman. Um, talking about the investment in tribal communities and the impact that it has uh, beyond that, the connection that that we have. From, from Pequot to Glen Cove, Long Island, you know, separated by over 100 miles, yet we had an economic partnership between the ferries that we were able to build uh, using uh, access to, to regional employees uh, that we didn't have the skill set for uh, at Mashantucka. We employed former welders uh, and painters and builders from, from EB who had laid off thousands of, of individuals. We rehired them through our efforts as a tribe and then connected us to your port in Glen Cove. I mean, that's... That, again, that's the power of economic development in any country. I don't need to be persuaded that the cause here is just, that this is the right thing to do. Uh, you, I don't have to be persuaded as to how effective it could be in actually improving the lives of not only uh, your members, but of the people that you interact with as well. Uh, and I just need to be more educated. I'm going to get on, I respect Mr. Kind incredibly. I'm going to get on his bill. If there's other bills that you want to recommend that we support that are already out there, uh, please just share those with us. You can do that now if you want to. Uh, and I'm going to get more engaged in this issue to try and be helpful uh, because, you know, I've just, I just actually had to go to a meeting earlier talking about the way the, the Chinese government has treated the Tibetan Buddhists. It's a very important issue. It's about basic justice. But we have to think about ba basic justice issues right here in the United States of America and what we need to do to be treating the tribes as sovereign nations and respecting their authority to try and help their people and to help them any way we can and not be a hindrance to them helping their people. So the, you don't need to persuade me that this is the right thing to do. I just need to be more educated on the details. Thank Are there any other particular bills you want to bring up that I should be paying attention to? Yes, I, I would pay attention to uh, what's happening with a report that was delivered to Congress last Christmas. It was the week before Christmas called the Broken Promises Report. And it was authored by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. And it's uh, a companion to a study that was done in uh, 13 years prior. And both reports concluded not one federal agency is living up to the trust responsibility. So in the absence of Congress fully funding a wide spectrum of issues, we have a very clear vision on how to close that gap. We've encouraged that committee to look at a, a strategic nation rebuilding. Where is the Marshall Plan for Indian Country? Because not only do we have the ideas that are advanced, through legislation and a reactive posture to what is in play here in Congress. We have interactions, uh, for example, with countries outside of the United States. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. Back in 2006, we were looking at a cap and trade system. The domestic market was trading at 2 to $3 a metric ton because it's a voluntary system in this country through the Chicago Climate Exchange, an exchange in California, and one in New England. The international market was trading at $32 a metric ton. Domestic companies could not access those markets because the U.S. is not a signatory to the Kyoto Protocol. 
And so tribal nations could enter into those. So what are those other sectors where it makes great business sense, but there's political limitations? We're in a position to attract foreign investment that otherwise would not come to the United States. Okay, I want to thank all of you for your time. And Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for calling thank this you. hearing. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Arrington, you're recognized for five thank, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the panelists for your time and insight into uh, the tax code and its impact on tribal communities. Um, of the tax incentive programs that have been discussed today, and maybe there are others that haven't, but opportunity zones, new market tax credits, the tax exempt uh, bonds, which of the programs would have the greatest impact uh, or are having the greatest impact and maybe need to be looked at in terms of tweaking it or expanding it or removing restrictions that, uh, that are not fair and equitable relative to other uh, sovereign local uh, government. So can you guys just give me kind of your rank order of your top two that would, would have and are having the greatest impact towards the end of, uh, of economic development for your community? Ms. Sharp, just start with you. Yes, thank you. I think the, the single most important tax policy that this Congress could do to uplift tribal nations is to directly address the threat to tribal sovereignty in dual, ta uh, dual taxation. Okay. The inability for us to freely exercise an inherent power to raise necessary revenues has been an impediment and a barrier, but once lifted in with this Congress upholding its trust responsibility, it will go a long way. Okay, great, fair point. Keep going, please. Ms. Danforth, do you have a top program that you think is having the greatest impact? The tax exempt credits, I think, are, are, are very uh, essential. You know, the, the allocations expired in, in December of last year um, to reallocate um, funding and without the essential government tests would be very important. Can, can I ask this question, and I don't know who the best person to answer it is for me, but what, what's the impetus behind that essential government function? Somebody put that in there because they had a, there's had to be a rational purpose at the time, I mean, I know a lot of the things that we do here in Congress aren't considered rational by most Americans, but what was the impetus behind that? Why was that in there in the first place? I'm looking at you, Mr. Butler, but Mr. Kahn? Well, I would say that, look, I mean, it went in place back in the 80s, so I don't know that anybody was here when it was put in place and who can really define what the intent was. Um, it may have been to slowly uh, address an issue, a bigger issue. Um, and it was just out of, uh, I dare to say ignorance, but ignorance to the, to, the, to the broader implications of it that it would have on tribal economies. Uh, but, but regardless of how it got there, it's mm -hmm. something that's so simple and obvious today that we all agree on should be fixed. And it should be a quick fix to just remove that. that uh, it, it appears that way to me, intuitively, that it seems like a, a, a quick fix for, for parity, but I'm gonna dig a little deeper because I just wanna know why it was in there in the first Absolutely. place. Mr. Khan a question about the state versus direct funding. Uh, interesting debate and conversation on that, um, but apparently there are some states with tribal communities that are receiving literally none of the credits and in, uh, in, in these programs and the benefits of these programs. What would the governor say if they were here? I'd love to hear their side of this. What would they say? Pick a state that was mentioned earlier. What would they say if we asked them? You only have a certain allotment you're supposed to be looking at a certain set of metrics and the return on the investment of the, uh, for these tax breaks in terms of jobs and economic impact in distressed areas, what would they say? You, you know, that's a, that's a tough question. I, I, don't, I don't know what, what they could say. I mean, um, you know, we're, you know, from, a, from an accounting perspective, you know, we're scratching our heads in, in some of the instances. And um, you know, uh, uh, going back to the creation of the, the your 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 question before that with the essential governments test, yeah. I think that's just you know a, a, a continuous infringement on on sovereignty. Um, you know, we don't want to speculate to why that was put in there, but I, you know, we I think the the feeling is that it's the same uh, challenge to tribal sovereignty and, and challenges that we've had uh, with being relevant uh, for many years. Just to follow up question on the lack or the disparity of treatment in terms of credits and benefits flowing to tribal communities. I'd love to hear an example of a project that would have, that would have met all the metrics that should have been funded, some track for opportunity zones, some project for new market credits. 
give me an example. It's maybe everybody start, I've got 19 seconds, so maybe one example. Ms. Stamforth, can you give one example I'm, of the project? I would say like a wastewater treatment facility, for example, like we could get some IHS funds to do that to help the tribe finance that, but that's an essential government um, um, gotcha. project. And so that would be one that, you know, we were sometimes in situations where the local municipalities have disagreements with the tribes over the whole taxation that Indians don't pay taxes, the lack of education. And, and I, I hate to say it, but there is some ignorance around that. And they're like, you know, you, you want everything for free. And it's like, but you don't need to, what you need to understand is we supplement a lot of the state programs. We supplement them by our schools, by our law enforcement, by the healthcare, by social services program that we're able to get funding from and somewhat from federal funding. And so if they would understand the benefit that we bring and if, if they would have um, the opportunity to educate themselves, but you also have to look at the era, like Mr. Butler said, is that in the 80s, the, the tone was very different. And I, and I could say that specifically. The Thank you, Mr. Danworth. My time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kine, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your indulgence letting us uh, sit on the dais today for this important hearing. And I also want to thank all our witnesses for uh, your very timely and important testimony. There are a lot of issues of parity that this Congress needs to be focused on. And you sitting here highlighting many of it today, I think, gives us a special mission to continue working with you to try to overcome some of the shortfalls that we've had for, for many, many years in this country. And that's why, as a new member of Congress, one of the first things I did was listen to Dan's Uncle Dale and immediately joined the Native American Caucus. And all of you may be familiar with Dale Kelly. He was a leader on these issues, fond of carrying a constitution in his left front pocket where he'd pull it out and remind all us members of how it's enshrined, embedded in the constitution, the, the separate sovereign status of tribal nations throughout the, throughout the country. And that needs to be our North Star, our guiding light, and trying to recognize that and make sure it's reflected in all the policies that we pass, especially right now with the tax code. And that's why, as a kid growing up in western Wisconsin, uh, a state with 11 federally recognized tribes from the Ho-Chunk Nation in the heart of my district, Ms. Davids is a proud member of that, she testified earlier, to the St. Croix Chippewa, to the proud Oneida Nation, and Ms. Danforth, you've been such an exemplary leader for the Oneida Nation, but for the state of Wisconsin generally, and it's proud to have you here testifying before our committee today, to the Potawatomi, to the Lakota Ray, to Mole Lake, uh, and it goes on and on, but I personally have witnessed as a kid growing up and I was a representative of the state that the tribes in my state tend to punch up above their weight. When it comes to issues that need to be addressed on the community level, it's the tribes that oftentimes are stepping in, helping to address it. The infrastructure investments you make, the education system, health care you provide, economic development, the job creation. It's, it's a heck of a story, and it's something that we need to be reminded of, I think, constantly here. So I think the good news today, a lot of the issues that you raised here today, we were trying to address in bipartisan legislation that I've introduced along with Mr. Kelly and Ms. Walorski and Mr. Swikert on that side, Ms. Dalbeni and Ms. Moore on our side. In fact, Ms. Howland, Ms. Davids, uh, Tom Cole, who submitted written testimony, are all original sponsors of the Tribal Tax and Investment Reform Act. And what does it do? Well, it does establish parity with respect to tax exempt bond issuance and excise taxes, something we've heard repeatedly uh, this morning. It also establishes equal treatment of pension, employee benefit plans maintained by tribal governments, something else that we've heard this morning. It establishes equal treatment of tribal foundations and charities, like charities funded and controlled by other government entities uh, in our country. It improves the effectiveness of the tribal child support enforcement agencies by granting equal access to the federal parent locator service, federal tax refund offsets, it also recognizes tribal governments for purposes of determining the adoption tax credit whether a child has special needs. And this has wide bipartisan support right now. Uh, but to Mr. Swazi's point, and I want to make sure that the record is clear, since none of you have specifically mentioned that legislation, do any of you here today testifying have any objections to that tribal tax and investment reform bill that we've introduced? No objections. Yeah. No. None, Absolutely none. None. Yeah. none. None whatsoever, and we can't thank you enough for your leadership on this on this issue. And because of your efforts, it leads to the conversation we're having here today. That was 25 years in the absence. So thank you for that. Yeah, that's right. So I'm safe to assume that all of you here testifying is in support of that bipartisan legislation, encouraging us to try to move forward on it in a bipartisan and bicameral way. 
Is that safe to say? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Great. Yeah, because these hearings, too, are an opportunity to educate members uh, on the dais and in the Congress, too, about what has been introduced and what does make sense, but also to provide feedback for us as we're working on the legislation for fixes or maybe new ideas that come up. So we look forward to continuing to engage all of you. And I've had conversations with many of you here today about this legislation and also the other things that we need to be focused on as we move forward. So we'll look forward to working with you with that support. And you're not alone. Mr. Chairman, we've got letters of support from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in support of the legislation I just mentioned, along with the Ho-Chunk Nation in the heart of my congressional uh, district. And I ask unanimous consent to have those inserted in the record at this Without time. Without objection, such should be the order. And I'd also ask that the record be kept open for any additional letters of support that others may want to bring in light of the uh, Tribal Tax and Investment Reform Act that we've been working on, so that's reflected in the record as well. No objection. And finally, and we've talked about this previously, but it's going to be a conversation for uh, some time, but we also have opportunity zones right now where some tribal nation areas have been designated, others have been left out. So we're trying to figure out a way, how do we bring that early stage capital into the tribal areas that have been overlooked for too long? Um, and there's work that can be done there. I know working with Senator Scott on the Senate side, he's open to maybe opening up uh, redesignation of some of these zones into tribal areas. So let's continue that conversation too, because this could be another opportunity for upfront investment for economic development, so you all can reach your full potential ultimately. Well, so thank, thank you, you. gentlemen. Time has expired. Mr. Kildee, you're recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> First of all, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do think it's important to, to thank Chairman Thompson and the full committee Chairman Neal for, for holding this hearing. Uh, we began talking about this uh, early this year, or I'm sorry, early last year, uh, and have had several meetings. And this is just really an important moment. I think we need to stop and pause and make sure that we know these things don't happen automatically. Somebody had to make the decision to hold this hearing and invite, invite these witnesses here and understand the issues that are facing Indian country and um, I want to thank Mr. Thompson particularly for, uh, for doing that. And, of course, we hope this soon leads to action. Um, I, as Mr. Kind and, and others have mentioned, I had um, a certain advantage when I arrived here in Congress on these issues in the sense that well, I got here eight years ago. For about 40 years, I've been hearing about these issues from uh, my uncle. Uh, you know, our family uh, originated from northern Michigan in the, in the Leelanau Peninsula in the Grand Traverse. Was Traverses. that Dale? That would be Dale, and I'm Dan, <laughs> just so you get it right, Mark. <laughs> you know, um, the relationship between our family and, uh, and Native Americans in northern Michigan goes back a long way, and I think that informed my uncle's views. He educated me on these issues. I arrived here understanding uh, what sovereign, uh, sovereignty truly means. I understood the issues, the need for parity. I understood some of this because I was educated on it. The best advocacy when it comes to these questions is information. Uh, it's, it's persuasive when members come to understand what the true relationship between our governments really are, the nation-to-nation -nation relationship. So it's really important that we educate one another. And I think we can continue to work, I think, in a very bipartisan fashion uh, if we do that, because the Constitution applies to all of us. Um, I do think there have been opportunities missed. Some of the problems that relate to the tax code and other aspects of federal law are traceable to a time um, when there was not so much enlightenment on the relationship and the trust responsibility that we, sh that we have. And so, tribes were simply excluded. So often, for example, when there are references to programs and policies that the federal government provides to state and local governments, the silence of those statutory uh, references on tribes is not neutral. It's exclusive. It excludes tribal governments from really essential programs and opportunities that the federal government should be providing to all citizens. And we, it's not a neutral um, impact. So I, I would be interested in, in, in your thinking on what, and this goes to what Mr. Kine was raising, what we can do that is specific and actionable and would have the biggest effect. Uh, last thing I'll say, and then I'll let you all address that. 
Um, this ta the, the tax issues are not the only issues. I'll give you an example. Indian Health Service does not have the benefit of advanced appropriations. Unlike every other health program that we operate, if there happens to be a, uh, a government shutdown or some other interruption, those government services through IHS are shut down. We ought to fix that. We just ought to fix it. I think it's just finally coming to the place where when it comes to state and local governments, we always have to make sure that in the drafting of these statutes and the drafting of the tax code, as we could and should have done in 2017, I wrote to the, to the committee at that point in time asking them to do that. We have to include tribal governments explicitly, not implicitly, explicitly. Um, so I, I just wonder if you might, uh, and you've been asked this before, but I'm just curious if anyone would like to say, what's the thing? Like, what's the one thing you're looking for us to do coming out of this hearing? I would uh, suggest that we, first of all, I want to recognize, too, the amount of work that went into this and the leadership that was necessary to bring us here. We, that cannot go um, unanswered, so thank you for making that point. I think one of the, the, the most important things that we want coming out of this is as another session. This should be a first step in a relationship that we want to build. Uh, I made the point of encouraging a, an invite out to Indian country in response to Mr. Kine's legislation. I think that there's a lot more to be learned to understand the context of these policies. These are long-standing century old, centuries old challenges. And for anyone that comes out to Indian country to see the impacts of public policy and how it directly affects us is important. So I, I would recommend that we are in a fact-finding stage. We have a recommendation that there be a direction to Treasury to undertake us an economic study on dual taxation and other things. So I would strongly encourage the committee to understand that this is but a first step. There's massive amounts of information and education and understanding because to truly and effectively deal with the economic challenges facing Indian country, it's, it's so important, critically important to understand the full scope of both our economic and political challenges. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. much. I yield back. The time has expired. Ms. Wolorski, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to echo my colleagues' comments that uh, to thank all of you for being here and how important it is that we're all here and that the positive things that we're hearing today as bipartisan and the education and the advocacy that you provide, I think just um, can't be underlined enough. I think it's, and to your comments, Ms. Sharp, I think it's a great starting point and I think it's a great thing for what will happen in the future and I think it's long overdue as well. I also think that um, just for the record, um, Chairman Weasel, I think just in, in your chairmanship of the Pokagon Band, you know, one of the things we can't overlook is what a partner you've been in our local community. I mean, it has been incredible, you know? So in our community, obviously, I'm sitting right here in D.C. I watch our local news all the time. A couple, About a month ago, I see where, you know, the leadership of the Bacon Band was doing a golf outing, raised almost a million dollars for one of our local hospitals. Their name is on our minor league stadium, Cubs uh, minor league stadium, which has turned out to be one of the greatest family entertainment, low cost, Apple Pie, uh, Baseball, and South Bend, and the Bokagan Band have really branded in our community. And I think a lot of folks don't look at that partnership, you know, and, and um, how you have taken care of veterans and your medical services. So, you know, I just think it's really important when we talk about these issues that we're talking about incredible impacts on our communities as well. But the Bokagan Band is unique, uh, Chairman, we saw, as you mentioned before, because the reservation site sits on two states. Can you address what kind how is that for you is that what kind of challenges does, it, does that present well the um, thank you um, congresswoman and again thank you for all of your support um, for us it becomes an education process because just with your own comments talking about giving back to the community what a lot of folks don't recognize that's our home we're not giving back to you know other folks we're, we're actually taking care of our own community that's right which the current community benefits from. Mm -hmm. So the investments that we make uh, are, are just improving where we, where we ourselves live, work, and play. Um, so that, that's important. And it's um, being the only federally recognized Indian tribe in Indiana and probably 
potentially the only federally recognized Indian tribe in Indiana. Uh, it is an education process. Uh, it, it, it is a challenge. Um, I do feel that we've got a very good start with the current administration. Uh, we've got very good relationships going. And it's all about relationships for me. It's not about partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, but I would, if, if I may, I want to go back to a question that uh, Congressman uh, Arrington, I think, asked about priorities. You know, we've, we've talked here today about big picture things. And uh, one of the things that I don't think we want to uh, forget or overlook is something as simple as the CDFI and uh, the, the little folks, what I refer to as kind of the little folks. We have a very successful CDFI program that helps rebuild our tribal citizens' credit and even small business. It's not about you know the big businesses that bring in the big bucks. It's about also helping uh, individual tribal citizens you know, being able to stand on their own two feet, becoming self-sufficient, becoming economic, you know, entrepreneurs and, and becoming, you know, true contributors. So I don't want to take a lot of your time answering somebody else's question, but I don't think we want to overlook that either. We, we have spent most of the day here talking about big picture, but there is a little picture. But it, uh, to get back to your question, it's been a challenge, um, but it's, it's been a positive challenge. It's been a, a great learning experience, not only on our behalf, but also on the uh, administration that we work with from over the years, different administrations, both parties, uh, since 1994. And, and I appreciate that. And can you, can you just um, give us a little bit more detail? You mentioned that the tribe created Manoba Madsen companies to diversify and strengthen your own tribal's economy. Can you talk a little bit more about what those companies do? Yes, we, we created an economic charter, uh, did that to try to keep the tribal politics out of it. Uh, funded them, let them go about their business. They currently own um, seven different companies that have become very, uh, very productive, uh, kind of across the board. We've got uh, our own architect architectural firm, which is doing work across the country. We have our own um, uh, civil engineering, large plumbing company, molding company, uh, getting into real estate. So going out and doing a lot of things other than what the tribe has been involved in. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentlewoman. Uh, recognize Mr. Smith for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, in, when you look at the current law, there's a huge disparity in the adoption tax credit, as was mentioned um, earlier, uh, amongst, amongst the tribal courts and just if a normal person adopts a child with special needs, they get the tax credit. But if it's done in a tribal court, they don't. Um, this is, this is a part of legislation that I believe is, is not, uh, not proper. And it's because the states right now decide what is considered special needs, and tribal courts are unable to do that. I would love to hear each one of your input um, in regards to how you've seen maybe the adoption tax credit have an unfair advantage of tribal courts and state courts? I think uh, being able to access uh, opportunities to help children. Uh, when you have a special needs child, uh, there are current present day impacts to that child, but there are also long-term needs that sometimes go into the adulthood. And so if a family doesn't have the total resources that under any form of law that is necessary to help make that child whole, we are going to pay for that at some point in the future. And so it would make a lot of sense to ensure that children who are adopted through a, a tribal court order have access to any other services, any other benefit that any other child would realize that's adopted on the outside because we, we are already at a disadvantage economically. Ms. Danforth, have you seen uh, any disparity there? Uh, yeah, and I, I think what needs to happen is some recognition and reciprocity between the state and tribal courts in relationship to the adoption tax. Um, as Fawn said, it is very important that we are servicing the neediest of the need, which is our children. You know, they, they, they do need to be served. The families do need the assistance. And um, historically, that's been an issue, um, like I spoke earlier, of the blended families. If some of those blended families could have had the opportunity for an adoption tax, maybe those processes would have been followed. And a lot, again, there's an education process with that. So thank you. 
Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, with my two colleagues. And but, but I think it highlights the fact that there's you know the earlier questions about what are the, the one or two big things that we can do. Um, those intend to be incredibly difficult when you try to narrow it down to one thing. When you add up you know issues like the like the tax credit, um, like the essential government function test, and, and many other uh, components that that are holding back uh, economic development uh, and just community development in any country. Those are the things that are very quickly and easily identif identified and that we can address quickly through legislation because, again, people see them as just simple common sense ish initiatives um, that there's really no disagreement on. And then, we don't, and then we can slowly work our way up and build trust amongst our communities uh, and get to those broader, bigger, heavier issues like dual taxation and the like. So again, these are great examples of very specific initiatives that we agree on and, and the approach. Uh, and, and and we should be able to move forward pretty quickly on that. Um, you know, I, we absolutely agree. I mean, leveling the playing field is is extremely important. And I mean, when it comes to uh, adoption in our children, you know, that's uh, uh, it's extremely important that they get off with the right start. And um, I mean, all of these programs really tailor into you know being able to support our communities in a much bigger way. I think it's all been said. Yeah, the, the thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Yield back. Obviously, I don't sit in the chair very often. Yeah. The button is somewhere else. <laughs> Look, gentleman yields back. Uh, gentleman uh, from New York is recognized. For I five appreciate uh, the recognition. And I, and I appreciate the, the, the chairman uh, on the subcommittee for allowing us, uh, not on the subcommittee, to be here today. Um, and I want to just start um, uh, my testimony and, and questioning by saying uh, I am firmly committed uh, to what uh, Native American uh, populations across the country are doing. Uh, I have um, a nation in the, in the uh, district of Western New York, the Seneca Nation in particular, that I have a very strong relationship with. And it's based on that fundamental commitment to sovereignty uh, of the uh, Native American uh, nation there uh, and their lands and the respect that I've tried to demonstrate through our tenure in Congress uh, of that issue of sovereignty. And uh, the other thing that I, I, I do, would not want to lose sight of in this uh, questioning today is uh, how inspiring it is to watch the Native American populations across the nation uh, to embrace uh, their self-determination uh, and to take uh, this opportunity that many of these tax policies represent and this respect for your sovereignty uh, to enhance and create the culture and the vibrancy uh, of your communities again. And I will just tell you, I'm, I, I'm impressed and I am grateful uh, of the commitment that the nations that I have seen uh, that have gone down that path. Uh, I've seen firsthand your cultural centers of it, essentially embracing what I would argue is Republican ideology uh, in the sense of lower taxes, provide a competitive environment upon which you can then control your own determination and self-determination going forward with economic opportunity and economic growth. And we see that right in Western New York. Uh, our nation, I think, employs um, a few thousand individuals of Native American populations, but it also employs thousands of non-Native Americans. And so my questioning here today is to, one, be here today off of this subcommittee to show my commitment to this relationship and this commitment to sovereignty, uh, respect. Uh, but also, could you, could you maybe testify as to what you're doing in the communities in regards to those non-Native uh, populations? Because when I see the nations working nation to local community in a respectful, symbiotic type of relationship, everybody wins. And I was wondering if you could offer uh, some examples uh, of that type of relationship. Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Khan? Absolutely. Um, I mean, in, in our local community, we have some great partnerships uh, with law enforcement, with the uh, uh, emergency services, um, the, uh, you know, the county when it comes to traffic circulation, we part participate in a lot, of, a lot of ways to really make our, 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 our community safer. And so for us, um, you know, building upon that is, is very important. We're trying to do the same thing that uh, local governments and state governments are doing out there, and that's, that's providing opportunities for our people. 
Um, and so not only are we collaborating, but we're also, you know, uh, kind of at a disadvantage at not being able to, to uh, you know, have the uh, different parities in these. Uh, in these absolutely. Areas. And we, we want to work with you in order to uh, address that. And so the, the issue of tax and, and the ability to use your, your sovereignty position uh, and your tax uh, programs and benefits uh, that uh, uh, we are trying to advocate for here and that have also uh, been able to secure, how does a lower tax environment uh, allow you to uh, grow uh, your Native American populations, Native American opportunities? Well, from an economic development perspective, it allows us to attract uh, outside capital, right? Because we can lower the investment rate, per se, the, re the expected return on investment that outside capital will have, require to invest in our lands. And so, again, I use, I keep going back to the Tanger example of building a, an outlet center uh, on our lands at Mashantucket. I mean, that wouldn't have happened if it weren't for the Hearth Act that allowed for us to take control of that dual taxation issue on that specific issue. Um, but when you look at, um, uh, the, the, the broader impacts that we have throughout the region, and, and, and Chairman we saw talked about this earlier, um, you know, what we do for our employees, you spoke of the thousand that the Great Nation, the uh, Seneca Nation have, that are non-citizens uh, of Seneca Nation, we're providing health care for them, we're providing uh, daycare benefits, we're providing uh, educational credits, we're providing uh, food assistance and the like. And so those are extended beyond our communities. And, and what are you doing for the, the dignity of the Native American folks on your, um, on your tribe when they have the ability uh, to have their own job, uh, when they have the ability to control their own destiny? Have you seen any uh, positive impacts on the quality of life of your uh, Native American populations as a result of that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's the core of what it's all about. Is it, that's right. And we can't lose sight of that. I think that's a sim simple view of a job is not just about a paycheck. It's, it's much more than that. And so as you go over the horizon and you go beyond the traditional not Native American um, industries, I, I applaud you and, and know that our office will stand with you shoulder and shoulder uh, to uh, provide those opportunities for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Reed. Thank the gentleman. Uh, I want to thank each of the witnesses. Uh, this is an important hearing. We've been pushing for this for a long time. Uh, it was, it was uh, really a great uh, opportunity for us to hear directly from those most affected by some of the mistakes of the past and gives us a chance to try to correct those mistakes. Each of you uh, added greatly uh, to the quality of this hearing. You presented your, your case very well. And as it was said, uh, this has to be viewed as only a first step. There's much more to be done. So thank you all. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job.